evening. Welcome. Yes, our first uh, virtual, uh, well, hybrid, I guess, meeting. Uh, so welcome. Uh, so welcome to the 110th meeting of the National Advisory Council for Nursing Research. Welcome to those in the room. Welcome to those online. Um, and of course, a special welcome to our council members uh, here on the NIH campus. And then of course, those joining virtually as well as to the NINR science community. So the meeting is uh, being videocast live and will be archived on the NIH videocast website. So again, thank you for joining us here in person or online today. Next slide, thank you. So, and, um, but before I begin, I would like to share some sad news uh, that Dr. Marguerite uh, Engler passed away in March of this year. Dr. Engler served in several roles uh, during her time at NINR, including as acting scientific director and as chief of the cardiovascular symptoms unit in the division of intramural research. So we were fortunate uh, to have had her expertise and experience here at NINR, and I know that she will be missed um, by those of you who knew her through her work at NINR, at NIH, or the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences, where she most recently served. So our sympathies go out to her family and her loved ones, and notably her twin sister, Mary. So may I have the next slide, please? So today, also bittersweet, we are thanking two departing council members for their service to NINR and to our advisory council. January's meeting was Dr. Grayson Holmbeck's final meeting as a council member. And today is Dr. John Lowe's final meeting with us. So I have so enjoyed working with you. I have so appreciated your thoughtful counsel. Um, we appreciate your service to the Institute and we look forward to working with you as we move forward. So thank you. So next slide. We have a lot to cover today. Um, after we go over meeting logistics, I'll provide my director's report. Of course, there are lots of updates on our research, our partnerships and our collaborations. And I'll also go over the news that's happening here at NINR as well as at NIH. So let me now turn it over to Dr. Elizabeth Tarlov, uh, the council's executive secretary who will proceed with meeting logistics. Good morning and welcome. I will now do a roll call of council members to ensure we have a quorum for today's meeting. For those here in the room, please raise your hand and say present or here when I call your name. For those participating virtually, please turn on your video for the roll call and say present or here when I call your name. Dr. Ayala? Here. Dr. Beckemeyer? Here. Dr. Fitzpatrick? Here. Dr. Johnson? Here. Dr. Lee? Present. Dr. Lowe. Here. Dr. Monroe. Here. And Dr. Provencio Vasquez. Here. And I note that Dr. Sullivan is present as ex officio for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Welcome, Dr. Sullivan. Thank you. Do Dr. Zenk, we have a quorum for this meeting. Dr. Atkins, Mr. Dawes, and Dr. Stone were unable to join us today. I'll now turn to a vote on minutes from the last council meeting. Minutes of the January meeting were made available in the electronic council book for your review. May I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. A second. 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 Thank you. Any discussion? Any opposed to approving the minutes? Motion carries. Council members, you may feel free to turn off your video now. Next slide, please. Thank you. On meeting logistics, first for those participating virtually, a reminder to please mute yourself when you are not speaking to eliminate background noise and to please turn your cameras on during discussion. 
For those council members in the room, please use the push to talk fe feature on the microphone in front of you to ensure that everyone can hear you. This is a one day meeting only. As always, a recording of this meeting will be available at the address shown on the slide. Closed session will begin approximately 15 minutes following the end of open session. A separate meeting invitation was sent to council members participating virtually and all applicable staff with login instructions for the closed session. Dates for future meetings are listed on the NINR Council webpage, as well as in the open session materials in the electronic council book. Please add these dates to your calendar. Our next meeting is scheduled for September 12, 2023, here in Bethesda. I want to remind you that as special government employees, council members may not engage in lobbying activities while receiving pay from the federal government. Further information regarding conflict of interest and confidentiality requirements are posted in the electronic council book, so please review those if you haven't done so already. I will give more specific instructions about conflict of interest and confidentiality at the beginning of the closed session later this afternoon. Now I'll turn it back to Dr. Zank for the NINR Director's Report. All right, thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, so yes, as uh, she said, I'll give the Director's Report. Next slide, please. So let's start with a quick budget update. Um, here's our appropriations history uh, over the last several years. The president submitted his fiscal year 24 budget to Congress back in March, highlighting his priorities for NIH. The president's uh, proposed budget retains the $10 million enacted for health disparities research that NINR received in fiscal year 23. Congress will, of course, ultimately decide on the final funding level, so we'll wait and see uh, what they decide. Next slide, please. So as you know, beginning last year, we focused our director's lecture series on the strategic plans lenses, and we've continued that series uh, this calendar year. In February, we held a lecture on the systems and models of care lens, and then earlier this month, we focused on the prevention and health promotion lens. So we were um, very excited to see so much community interest in these lectures related to the new strategic plan. And if you miss them, you can find uh, links to all the lectures in the series on our website. Next slide, please. Our next and final director's lecture, series, uh, lecture of the series will be on July 12th. And Dr. Sarah Stoddard at the University of Michigan and Dr. Paul Kunert uh, of the Public Health Accreditation Board will be giving that lecture. They'll be speaking on our population and community health lens. Next slide, please. And in June, we are pleased to be co-hosting a lecture with our colleagues at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities and the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research. NINR Council Member uh, Professor Daniel Dawes will share his expertise as a scholar, educator, and researcher on health equity and health reform, health systems transformation, and social and political determinants of health. And then uh, join me for a Q&A. So you can find more information and register on our website. Next slide, please. So, and now an update on some of our extramural science activities. Next slide. This year, extramural staff represented NINR at the annual meetings of the regional nursing societies. These outreach visits included formal presentations, roundtable discussions, and one-on-one -on -one meetings with researchers and students, among other activities. NIR staff provided insights on our strategic plan, our funding opportunities, training, and grantsmanship. So I know that these sessions were valuable to the nursing science community, given that over the past year, we've been implementing our latest strategic plan. I wanna thank all the extramural staff for sharing your expertise at these sessions. And I also wanna thank the researchers and students who attended these sessions. To learn more about how you can consider your research within these lenses of the strategic plan. 
Next slide. In February, we did issue two RFAs, we reissued them. Um, so first, the advancing integrated models of care to improve pregnancy outcomes among women who experience persistent health disparities. And the second reissue was evaluating the impact of pandemic era related food and housing policies and programs on health outcomes and health disparity populations. But also in February, we released the Bridge to Care Initiative. This is a new funding opportunity that invited intervention studies that leverage clinical community partnerships to address individual and families' unmet social needs or communities' adverse social conditions with a focus on health disparity population. Through our NOSI on administrative supplements uh, to T32 grantees, we announced that NINR aims to train new cohorts of nurse scientists to address prevention of firearm injury and related health disparities. As you know, our first ever strategic imperative is around firearm injury prevention, and I'm excited to help uh, to improve the capacity of nursing research in this area. So next slide, please. NINR funded research continues to yield results, including the papers that you see here that were published since our last council meeting. In Grayson's article published in Nursing Inquiry, the authors conducted a review of the literature that included social determinants of health and symptom clusters of chronic health conditions, most notably cancer. A majority of studies only described social determinants of health variables about 40% included analyses between social determinants and symptom clusters, though many included social determinants of health variables as only covariates in analyses. The authors conclude attention should be paid to how social determinants of health information is collected and analyzed so that future research can reveal mechanisms of symptom disparities and how to alleviate them. In this second example, Clark and colleagues explore the potential increased risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus among individuals with vision impairment who are aging. The researchers analyzed data from a cohort of over 22,000 adults with vision impairment using a private administrative claims database to investigate the connections between environmental factors and the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. The researchers found that factors that increase risk of diabetes among older adults with vision impairment included living in neighborhoods with more intersections and high-speed roads. On the other hand, environmental factors that reduce the risk for both younger and older adults included living in neighborhoods with broadband internet access, optical stores, supermarkets, and gyms. For older adults, living in neighborhoods with more park area was associated with a reduced risk. Overall, the study results emphasize the importance of considering residential context of people with vision impairment and addressing health disparities. Next slide, please. So I'm also pleased to share an update on our intramural research activities. Intramural investigator Dr. Leo uh, Saligan recently established a collaboration with UCLA scientists on their Health of Philippine Immigrant Study to explore social, nutritional, environmental, and other factors affecting changes in physical activity patterns of Filipinos immigrating to the United States. Dr. Saligan is also a co-author on a newly accepted paper on the feasibility of DNA methylation age as a biomarker of symptoms and resilience among cancer survivors with multiple chronic conditions. Next slide, please. So NIH's 2023 poster day for both post-baccalaureate trainees was held on April 19th and 20th after three years as a virtual event. This year's event was hybrid with 980 presenters from across the NIH intramural research program. Post-baccalaureates presented their posters highlighting their independent project work and that of their research teams. I want to thank all the preceptors uh, who supported the postbacs at NINR. Now, two of our postbacs, Willa uh, Rikoff and Pooja Varma, also pre presented their work at the Muscular 
uh, Dystrophy Association Clinical and Scientific Conference in March. And we're also saying goodbye to two of our post who are leaving NINR to begin medical school. So Dr., uh, I'm sorry, not quite yet, Dr. Um, so Christopher Newen and Willa uh, Rekoff. So congratulations to all of them. Next slide, please. Last week, we co-hosted a virtual presentation with the Clinical Center's Grand Rounds. Dr. Hudson Santos, Associate Dean of Research, at the University of Miami School of Nursing and Health Studies, spoke on biological embedding and its importance to health equity. Dr. Santos is a nurse researcher with interests in Latinx maternal child health and child development, social genomics, social determinants of health, and health equity. His talk offered important concepts for clinicians as well as researchers to understand uh, when it comes to factors uh, that impact a person's health. So next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna to transition to news on our partnerships and collaborations at NIH and beyond. We are excited, um, as you know, to be on the executive committee for the NIH-wide Climate Change and Health Initiative. This initiative announced funding uh, of four sites in the Alliance for Community Engagement, Climate and Health. This is called ACE-CH. Uh, these two-year awards began in March of this year. The Alliance will address the impact of climate change on vulnerable communities through community-engaged research, capacity building, and outreach activities with a focus on health equity. Additionally, earlier this year, uh, actually this month, the Climate Change and Health Initiative awarded the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Boston University School of Public Health with a three-year grant to create a research coordinating center. The research coordinating uh, center will support the development um, of a climate change and health community of practice by managing and supporting current and future climate change and health research and capacity building efforts and supporting the expansion of the com community of practice. Next slide. A current funding opportunity for P20 exploratory grants for climate change and health research center development is encouraging the development of innovative transdisciplinary research to understand the complex effects of climate change on health in order to develop action-oriented strategies that protect health and build resiliency at the individual, community, national, and global levels. The deadline for applications is November 7th, so there is still plenty of time. And I also wanna remind you uh, to review the Climate Change and Health Initiative NOSI, which encourages applications that address the impact of climate change on health and well-being over the life course, including the health implications of climate change in the United States as well as globally. Next slide. On April 17th, I, along with my colleagues, the director of NIEHS, NIMHD, um, and NHLBI, briefed Senate and House Labor and Health uh, and Human Services Appropriations staff. We provided an overview of the NIH Climate Change and Health Initiative and the accomplishments um, from fiscal year 22, as well as plans for fiscal year 23 and 24. So I'm very pleased that the president's budget request includes uh, $65 million for the Climate Change and Health Initiative. Next slide. Obviously, we think nursing science can make a difference in addressing health effects of climate change. And we're interested in continuing and perhaps expanding our work in this area over the next few years. So we would like to get additional input from experts to address a fundamental question in what areas of climate change and health research can NINR and nursing science have the greatest impact? As you know, we've recently used council working groups to gather recommendations on other topics, such as inclusion in research, diversity in the nursing science workforce, and our overall strategic plan. The recommendations from those working groups have proved to be invaluable. So I'd like to propose today that we establish a new work group to make recommendations on future directions for NINR in climate change and health research. 
Unless I hear any objections from the council, we'll begin assembling that work group, including identifying NINR and council co-chairs uh, over the next several weeks, and then we'll provide an update to council in September on our progress. Um, and we'll also ask the group to present their recommendations by January. So I look forward to your thoughts, uh, the council on this recommendation. Next slide, please. The Helping to End Addiction Long-Term or HEAL initiative in which NINR is participating is now supporting the Purpose Network. The Purpose Network is a digital platform that will provide a centralized community for research trainees and researchers across the continuum of basic, translational, and clinical research. It will deliver weekly network digest via email, enable multidisciplinary collaborations when developing grant applications, and aggregate information around pain research, funding opportunities, and the HEAL initiative scientists. The Purpose Network also hosted a conference for early stage pain researchers and NIH funded mentors at National Harbor, Maryland earlier in May. So you can find more information on Purpose at the URL shown here. Next slide. Also from HEAL, HEAL has launched a monthly webinar series called HEAL Headlines. HEAL Headlines series provides a forum to disseminate HEAL science on a frequent basis, informs the HEAL network of cutting edge research, highlights early career researchers, and provides a virtual space for researchers to engage. So check that out as well. Next slide. So let's move on to improve. Uh, we continue to keep Congress abreast of activities with the Improve Initiative. In addition to briefing Representative Lauren Underwood in December of last year, on March 29th, I, along with uh, fellow co-chairs, NICHD Director Dr. D Diana Bianchi and ORWH Director Dr. Janine Clayton provided uh, House and Senate Appropriations Labor HHS staff with an update on current activities and the President's Fiscal Year 24 budget request for the IMPROVE initiative. IMPROVE is a collaborative uh, NIH-wide program focused on reducing preventable causes of maternal deaths and improving the health of women before, during, and after delivery. It emphasizes health disparity and dispro disproportionately affected populations. At the briefing, we also provided data on the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in all populations and comparatively in racial and ethnic groups. So I am also pleased that the president's budget request includes $30 million for the IMPROVE initiative. Next slide. In April, NIH announced the next round of winners uh, in the IMPROVE initiative of its Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics Technology, or RADx Tech, for Maternal Health Challenge. This is an $8 million prize competition to accelerate the development of technologies to improve maternal health outcomes for those living in areas lacking access to maternity care. The challenge seeks um, promising home-based or point-of-delivery uh, diagnostic devices, wearables, and other remote sensing technologies to improve postpartum health care in these so-called maternity care deserts, which include urban and rural areas across the United States. Winning projects include wearable monitors for cardiovascular health, a monitoring system for postpartum depression, a smartphone app to detect postpartum anemia, and many more. Also in 2022, NIH launched, it launched its Connecting the Community for Maternal Health Challenge, also as part of IMPROVE. Now this challenge is intended to encourage nonprofit, community-based or advocacy organizations to enhance skills and infrastructure in pursuit of research projects in maternal health including maternal morbidity and mortality. The first round of winners for the gathering phase were announced in January and included projects focused on maternal health literacy and nutrition, resiliency in the perinatal period, and the impact of equitable doula care on maternal and child health outcomes, among others. 
Next slide. I reported in January uh, that NINR, along with the Office of Research on Women's Health and other NIH institute centers and offices, were planning to post a request for information, or RFI, uh, on violence against women. This RFI uh, was intended to gather public input on priority scientific directions in research on violence against women. The RFI was released in February, and we received 118 comments back from the public. So we're currently reviewing those comments, and I look forward to reporting on our planned activities at a future council meeting. Next slide. On Thursday, uh, June 15th, NIH will host a webinar to showcase two NIH R15 programs in which NINR participates, AREA and REAP, for undergraduate and graduate students, respectively. These programs expose students to research, strengthen institutions that have not been major recipients of NIH funding, and provide insight into the application process. Following the presentations, the students will have a chance to pose their questions to NIH program directors. Next slide. So I'm going to shift and share um, some NINR-specific news and announcements with you. I am pleased to welcome uh, new staff and interns to NINR, two IT professionals, Terrence Lindsay and Sina Lovo-Rosa, recently joined our NINR team. Dr. Tana Nelson joined the Division of Intramural Research in uh, Dr. Patty Brennan's lab this past February. And we'll have six interns joining our intramural research program this summer. So I want to welcome all of you to NINR. Next slide. NINR is seeking applicants uh, from outstanding clinician scientific, scientist candidates for the position of clinical director to provide visionary leadership in our division of intramural research. Now, the clinical director is responsible for the oversight of all clinical research within the division. The clinical director serves as a clinical pro, uh, policy advisor to the NINR director, as well as place, uh, plays a host of other uh, roles across the institute. So our search for the new clinical director is underway with acting clinical director, Dr. Kevin Camphausen, chairing the search committee. So that'll be open uh, until filled, and so um, please check that out and circulate within your networks. We are also now hiring program offices, officers in our uh, extramural research program division. Program officers plan, evaluate, and oversee activities for a portfolio in an assigned uh, program area. So we are specifically um, interested in expertise aligned with the research lenses and the strategic plan. Of course, they are health equity, social determinants of health, population and community health, prevention and health promotion, and systems and models of care. And we will uh, be recruiting for branch chiefs uh, within the extramural uh, science division. Branch chiefs will provide scientific leadership for NINR, and assess scientific opportunities and gaps, as well as propose future areas of programmatic emphasis in support of the NINR mission. So please check those out as well. Next slide, please. And uh, you'll find information on, on all of those, as well as upcoming opportunities at the URL uh, shown on the slide. You'll also find information on what we're looking for uh, as an institute, our scientific strategy, and much more. So I encourage you to sign up for NINR updates, which you can do from this URL uh, so that you don't miss a thing. Now, next slide. We have news to share uh, about NIH as well. In April, an RFI opened seeking recommendations for improving NRSA fellowship reviews. Now, this RFI, RFI is based on recommendations made by the Center for Scientific Review Advisory Council Working Group. The working group concluded that NIH was missing out on highly promising scientists by the way it was going about its selection process, which favored elite institutions, well-known sponsors, and relied on traditional methods of measuring academic success. Detailed findings from the RFI will be presented at an upcoming advisory 
committee uh, to the NIH director meeting. Next slide. Together with uh, other NIH institutes and centers, NINR co-sponsored two new NASM reports published in February and March of this year. The first report includes recommendations for approaches to address system, systemic barriers to participation in STEM for underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. The recommendations have broad application across many fields and many types of organizations. The second re report presented results of a consensus study to review and assess existing methodologies, benefits, and challenges in using race, ethnicity, ancestry, and other population descriptors in genomics research. The report definitively confirmed that scientists should not use race as a proxy for human genetic variability. And researchers should include and directly measure contextual factors, such as social and environmental exposures, behaviors, and culture in genetics and genomic studies, rather than using population descriptors, such as race, as a proxy. And uh, the report underlined that unexplained variants should not be attributed to racial and ethnic differences. So please check out that important report. Next slide. Dr. Tabak, uh, Acting NIH Director, and Dr. Carrie Wolinetz, who previously served as Senior Advisor to the NIH Director, uh, recently published a commentary about clinical trials research at NIH. In it, they share recommendations from um, an NIH-wide clinical trial stewardship task force which found that additional efforts are indeed needed to improve policies and address newly found obstacles and opportunities. So I should note that I represented NINR on this task force as a member of the DEI working group. So going forward, the plan is to concentrate on the following areas. Center opportunities around people and equity. This includes developing a vision and framework to promote research participants as partners across all studies. Second, optimize clinical trials networks and prepare for public health emergencies. This is based on the lessons from the pandemic. We wanna develop a consensus definition and a set of metrics for clinical trials research. Focus on data and design. Make data widely and freely available through decision-making tools. Oops, sorry, skipped a line. Make data widely and freely available while protecting patient privacy. Also, increase investment in getting results disseminated quicker. Uh, ensure quality, accountability, and oversight through decision-making tools. Determine which metrics are the best indicators of success. And finally, streamline infrastructure and create efficiency. There's a great deal of uh, variability across the institutes, and we need to address that. So look forward to hearing more about um, policy changes and um, further developments around clinical trials at NIH. Next slide. So as I wrap up, uh, NIH certainly congratulates Dr. Monica Bertinoli on her nomination by President Biden as the next NIH director, which is a Senate-confirmed position. Dr. Bertinoli currently serves as the NCI director. The NCI director position is presidentially appointed, but not Senate-confirmed. So until the NIH director nomination is confirmed by the U.S. Senate, Dr. Tavak continues to serve as the acting director of NIH, and Dr. Bertinoli remains as the NCI director. Now, in terms of next steps, Dr. Bertinoli will meet with the individual members of Congress, a process that will be managed by the Department of Health and Human Services. Barring concerns raised by congressional members during these meetings, the Health, I'm sorry, the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee will hold a confirmation hearing. After a hearing is held, the Senate deliberates and votes, uh, which generally occurs a few days after the hearing. Once confirmed, the nominee can begin the role as NIH director. So look forward to hearing um, about that process and the outcome. 
So as I wrap up, also, I want to certainly acknowledge Joni uh, Dawson and Joanne Kriebel at NINR for all their help in compiling the update. And I want to thank all my colleagues here at NINR and on council for your continued support of the Institute. So please feel free to reach out to us at any time at the email address you see here uh, with any questions, concerns, or for more information. So thank you. With that, so I'll just open if anyone has any questions or things they want to put on the table related to the update. Uh, Director Zank, if I can just um, offer strong support of the Climate Change and Health Task Force that you mentioned, I think that would be a, a great use of asset as council and I look forward to seeing those recommendations. Thank you, Chris. There. And I had similar enthusiasm for the RFA for the center grant mechanism for that. And I'm uh, eager to see how involved NINR will be in that and hopefully very. Yeah. Thank you. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. All right, so with that, we will move forward with the agenda. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to NINR's Chief Scientific Diversity Officer, Dr. Mia Rochelle Loudon who will present an overview of NINR's recent DEIA activities. So welcome, uh, Mia Rochelle. Thank you, Shannon. Good morning. I am pleased to provide an update on NINR's diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility activities. You may recall in September, co-chairs from two council working groups presented recommendations focused on strategies to strengthen inclusion in NINR supported studies and enhance diversity in the NINR supporting nursing science workforce. We shared the working group reports with you in January and both reports are also available on our website. We again want to recognize working group members for contributing their time and expertise. We thank the co-chairs and all the members of the Inclusion Working Group. We also thank the co-chairs and members of the Diversity Working Group. The reports offered short-term and long-term strategies on advancing inclusion in the science we support and advancing diversity in our research workforce. The Inclusion Report has three recommendations with eight strategies. The diversity report has nine themes with 16 recommendations and 60 strategies. These reports prompted us to think about our DEIA portfolio as a whole, where we already have investments and initiatives and where we have gaps. Today, I'm going to highlight examples of what we're currently doing in relation to these recommendations. And I'll also highlight areas based on the recommendations where we are planning to focus or expand our efforts next. Let me start with the recommendations on inclusion. The strategies to strengthen inclusion in NINR supported studies report included three recommendations. Promote engagement with populations underrepresented in biomedical research. Incentivize inclusion through responsiveness to funding initiatives and scientific review. And close research gaps on the most pressing health problems experienced by populations underrepresented in NINR funded studies through training and education on translation, dissemination, and implementation. Related to recommendation A to promote engagement, community engagement is already required or prioritized in NINR led and NINR participating funding opportunities. An example funding opportunity that NINR released earlier this year is the Bridge to, Init to Care Initiative, which Dr. Zink referred to in her remarks. Bridge to Care focuses on original intervention research to elucidate the health impact of intervening on social needs or social conditions by bridging clinical care with community services and resources. And importantly, this initiative requires the establishment of healthcare community partnerships. Other funding opportunities emphasize the importance of engagement with language such as community engagement is critical to this initiative. And do the key personnel have the appropriate expertise in community engaged research? Mm -hmm. 
as you know, NINR is a founding co-chair of the NIH-wide COMPASS program, which is focused on structural interventions to reduce health disparities and advance health equity. One of the innovative aspects of COMPASS for NIH is that COMPASS will directly fund community organizations to lead this research. We look forward to updating you on awards in coming months. Recommendation B prompts NINR to incentivize inclusion of underrepresented populations in NINR supported research through investigator training opportunities, inclusion responsiveness criterion and funding opportunities and application review. Health disparity populations are often underrepresented in biomedical research. Four recent NINR led funding opportunities require inclusion of health disparities populations in order for an application to be responsive to the funding opportunity. One additional NINR led funding opportunity indicates a focus on health disparities populations. An example initiative relevant to recommendation B is evaluating the impact of COVID-19 pandemic related food and housing policies and programs on health outcomes in health disparities populations. The funding opportunity indicates that responsive applications must include one or more of the following populations, racial and ethnic minority populations, less privileged socioeconomic status populations, underserved rural populations, and sexual and gender minorities. Recommendation C calls for NINR to promote rigorous study designs that incorporate engagement, inclusion, and retention of participants from underrepresented understudied or small population groups. NINR participated on the DEI working group of the NIH Clinical Trials Stewardship Task Force. So this is the task force that Dr. Zink mentioned in her remarks. That working group is charged with reviewing implementation progress of prior NIH policies, focused on enhancing diversity and inclusion in clinical research, addressing effectiveness in fulfilling the stated policy goals, and identifying areas of opportunity for further improvement. A JAMA Viewpoint article describing the task force was published in April 2023. Related to DEI, the article shares that NIH will consider whether new or enhanced policies are needed to increase diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the recruitment and retention of clinical research participants. These might include strengthening review of inclusion plans, updating language used in inclusion policies, new data collection and data improvement efforts, and centralizing approaches for recruitment. Let me move now to the working group recommendations on enhancing workforce diversity. The strategies to enhance diversity in the NINR supported nursing science workforce report identified nine themes. Increase awareness of NINR research lenses, increase awareness of nursing science, expand the underrepresented nursing science applicant pool, enhance the structure of research grants, leverage diversity initiatives, ensure sufficient diversity in training programs, enhance mentorship for underrepresented scientists, mitigate bias in the grant peer review process, and optimize experiences with NINR program directors. As I go through examples of our current activities related to these nine themes, I'll highlight some areas where we plan to expand our efforts. Just to remind you, related to theme one, the research lenses in the strategic plan are health equity, social determinants of health, population and community health, prevention and health promotion, and systems and models of care. To demonstrate our commitment to funding research aligned with our NINR research lenses, we issued companion R01 and R21 funding opportunities, NINR areas of emphasis for research, to optimize health and advance health equity. In addition to tying funding opportunities to our strategic plan, NINR has been actively working to get the word out about our strategic plan and research lenses as part of our communications efforts. For example, NINR representatives have given over 50 presentations for academic institutions, associations, and scientific meetings that included information about the strategic plan and research lenses. 
Dr. Zink and NINR staff have had nearly 30 meetings with various external groups to discuss opportunities to work together in supporting the research lenses. We've hosted four NINR director's lectures that highlighted examples of research aligned with the research lenses, and we have two more planned. These lectures were attended by thousands of participants, and the recordings have nearly 5,000 views on YouTube. We published a fact sheet on the research lenses in the strategic plan on our website that has been downloaded over 12,000 times. This is the most any document on our website has been downloaded in the past three years. Additionally, the strategic plan pages on our website have been viewed over 80,000 times. We recently produced four social media videos that we shared with partners and collaborators to promote key themes from the strategic plan. These videos are available on our YouTube channel. We will continue efforts to raise awareness of our research lenses and fund research in alignment with our strategic priorities. All these activities related to theme one increase awareness of nursing science as well. Which brings me to theme two, increasing awareness of nursing science. One recommendation under theme two is to promote nursing science as a career through funding. And we're doing this in many ways. We promote nursing science as a career through participation in NIH wide diversity initiatives. Through diversity F31 awards, promising predoctoral students receive individualized mentored research training from faculty sponsors while conducting health related scientific research. The candidate must be currently enrolled in a doctoral research program or in a formally combined professional, clinical and research doctoral program. For example, a PhD student or an MD PhD student would be eligible to apply. Research supplements to promote diversity in health related research aim to enhance the diversity of the research workforce by recruiting and supporting individuals from diverse backgrounds to be added on to existing NIH issued awards. We also support small business diversity supplements to enhance the diversity of the research and entrepreneurial workforce by recruiting and supporting students, postdoctorates, and eligible investigators from diverse backgrounds. From fiscal year 18 to fiscal year 22, NINR made 36 awards through these three programs. We encourage more applications to these programs to ensure that our workforce is inclusive of everyone. For theme three, CEPRA provides opportunities to pre-K through grade 12 students from groups underrepresented in the biomedical and behavioral sciences to learn about careers in biomedical research through formal and informal classroom projects. Participation in SEPA expanded from one NIH institute to an additional 17 NIH institute centers and offices, including NINR. These expanded SEPA funding opportunities, this expanded SEPA funding opportunity was posted last month and it's intended to allow more SEPA awards to be made. Nearly two years ago, NINR signed on to the Mosaic program to support postdoctorates from diverse backgrounds as they transition into independent faculty careers. Since that time, we were assigned two applications and have funded one. NINR considers career development applications only from research doctorate prepared applicants who have a bachelor's degree or higher in nursing. And we currently are supporting Dr. Ray's project studying racial disparities of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. We also support the first program which aims to transform institutional culture towards inclusive excellence by providing funds to hire diverse cohorts of early stage biomedical research faculty. In fiscal year 22, NINR contributed funds to add another university to this program. In fiscal year 23, NINR more than doubled our contribution compared to the prior fiscal year. Nursing schools co-lead two of the first program clusters, Drexel University and the University of South Carolina. We encourage participation in all of these new and expanded funding opportunities. <laughs> Theme four calls for NINR to support under-resourced institutions and underrepresented investigators. 
NINR signed on to STRONG, which aims to support research capacity needs assessments by eligible resource limited institutions. STRONG was posted in April 2023. NINR signed on to the REAP program, which aims to support small scale research grants at institutions that do not receive substantial NIH funding. This program provides biomedical research experiences primarily for health professional, undergraduate, and graduate students. For this initiative, NINR expressed a focus on health equity research. NINR is supporting three REAP awards. NINR participates in the research opportunities for new and at-risk investigators to promote workforce diversity. This program is intended to support new investigators and at-risk investigators from diverse backgrounds, including those from groups underrepresented in health-related sciences. NINR's specific areas of research interest for this initiative indicate that only applications that fall within NINR research lenses will be considered. This is a new initiative and awards will begin this summer at the earliest. Team five recommends that NINR champion new diversity initiatives aligned with the research lenses. NINR supports the NIH Institutional Excellence in Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Prize Competition. This prize aims to recognize transformative cultures, systems, projects, and processes developed by institutions to promote inclusive excellence and create environments that foster and value a culture of DEIA. The prize competition opened in April 2023 and closes in September 2023. This initiative aligns with NINR's commitment to DEIA described in our strategic plan. Since evaluation of diversity initiatives is an aspect of Theme 5, one area we will prioritize for next steps is developing benchmarks and tracking metrics for assessing our diversity initiatives. Theme six emphasizes the need to ensure diversity in the T32 training program. NINR participates in the NIH parent announcement for T32 institutional research training grants, specifying our commitment to training nursing, the next generation of nursing scientists through projects aligned with our research lenses. We currently support over a dozen T32 awards. Next steps in pursuing theme six will include assessing the diversity of our current T32 trainees. Theme seven focuses on incentivizing effective mentorship. NINR signed on to the notice for administrative supplements to recognize excellence in DEIA mentorship. This administrative supplement seeks to support scientists who are outstanding mentors and have demonstrated compelling commitments and contributions to enhancing DEIA and biomedical sciences. Awards have not yet been made. NINR also signed on to the reward program. This diversity R01 acknowledges that scientists who assume substantial academic service, outreach and mentoring duties to promote DEIA often experience career setbacks and difficulty supporting the research efforts because of the time they devote to their substantial DEIA efforts. Reward provides support for the health-related research of scientists who are making a significant contribution to DEIA and who have no current NIH research project grant funding at the time of award. Reward was posted in 2023, and NINR's specific areas of research interest for reward directly address our research lenses. For theme eight, mitigate bias in the grant review process. This is something that we need to look at the broader NIH landscape to consider. The NIH Center for Scientific Review is committed to addressing bias in peer review. CSR handles receipt and review of about 75% of the grant applications that NIH receives. For the NIH-wide Transformative Health Disparities Initiative that NINR helped to develop, applications from minority-serving institutions were reviewed in a special emphasis panel. 
To date, 11 grants have been awarded through this initiative, including five from MSIs. The funding opportunity for MSIs was reissued and those awards are pending. Recommendations under theme nine acknowledged numerous strengths of existing NINR programs and resources that can be built upon to optimize interactions between diverse investigators with NINR program directors. For next steps, we will seek to develop the types of resources suggested for theme nine. For example, a guide for what investigators can expect in their interactions with NINR program directors. Thank you for your attention. Before I open the floor up for questions, I wanted to pause and acknowledge that we've shared examples of activities for only a few of the working group's recommendations and themes. The reports were very comprehensive, and I want to assure you that we will reference them extensively to inform our future DEIA efforts. Although we might not be able to implement every strategy, your themes and recommendations will help us prioritize DEIA activities as resources, staff, and budget allow. I would be happy to hear your thoughts on this DEIA update. Thank you, Dr. Loudon. Um, so I have asked Dr. Lowe uh, to help lead us in discussion. So Dr. Lowe, please proceed. Yes, thank you. First, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's this, good to see you. This is uh, an effort <clears throat> that is tremendous and uh, reflects a lot of work from a lot of people and um, so grateful for it. And thank you for the new NINR research lenses because it lays the foundation, I think, for this work. And so without that work and those lenses, um, I don't think we would be hearing this, this report today. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Usually when I'm asked, as you know, um, to respond, I like to prepare and use my head and think a lot about uh, what's presented and uh, to prepare a response. Um, but I found when I was reviewing the information um, given to us, that I kept leaving my mind and going to my spirit. And I would just say my spirit is lifted with this. Um, this is sacred work. It's very sacred work because when we think about increasing the diversity, equity, and inclusion, we are reaching populations who have suffered immensely from inequities and health disparities. And so a lot of stuff that's been done, a lot of the things and initiatives that have been done have not impacted as we would uh, like it to be. And I think that looking through these lenses and taking these initiatives, my spirit says this can make a difference and it's sacred. And so thank you for that. Um, and then last, I would just say, speaking from a, as a, from a Native American perspective, as a nurse scientist, um, that we are so few of us. I mean, we have maybe three that I am aware of that are NIH supported in the country. And so these initiatives, there's a lot of, uh, that I think we can tap into, we can develop from, but, um, and then I've often thought about those who are coming in the pathway now, receiving their PhDs who are native nurse scientists who want to stay in their communities, who want to stay at their local uh, institutions to do the work because our communities like nurses and they like nurse scientists. And so um, I'm looking forward to collaborating with you on maybe looking at how we can enhance some oppor funding opportunities to uh, for the enhancement of those kinds of situations and to address those kind of what we might see as barriers for postdocs for enhanced 
research training for folks who can't lead and those of us who could maybe help them to create that network of mentorship, et cetera. So there are some mechanisms I know other institutes use, such as the R25. So I would uh, be willing to collaborate and work with uh, NINR on that initiative. So with that, thank you again. In our language, we say, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Loudon, and I uh, appreciate Director Zank's charge for these initiatives in the first place, um, and then your responsiveness in the report. Um, Dr. Monroe and I were speaking before the meeting about how much positive energy there is and how much growth there already has been, and the responsiveness is just another sign of that. So with all that energy and being in a good place with this um, mentally, then I just hope it really carries forward and that from this momentum, based on this fabulous start that we just have continued growth. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I also thank you for the, for the work and for the opportunity to contribute to this. Um, my, one of my questions though, is that I, I noted that uh, there were fewer, there was more in progress work while the task force was working on inclusion um, and maybe fewer opportunities for next steps. What do you see as as the as how we will build on what NINR was already doing at the time that the task force was working to move it even farther forward? Are there next steps for the inclusion group beyond working with the NIH um, organizations that NINR is already involved in? That is something that is still under discussion. So as we have been responding to the recommendations, one thing that we've spent time doing is really looking very carefully through all of them and thinking about feasibility, prioritization, and then understanding an inventory of all of our activities so that we can consider next steps. So we're very early on in the process overall. So I can't speak to the concrete next steps that will happen with inclusion just because we're early in the process but I do look forward to being able to engage with our council on that as well as provide updates in a future council meeting. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Dr. Lodum. My name is Suchi, by the way. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm curious, I have more questions actually. So can you define for me what is meant by community engagement? I was a little confused as to whether you were referring to engaging more diverse researchers or was it engaging more diverse participants in our research or was it a combination of both? Ideally, community engaged research would engage community partners and members of the community in the entire process. So identifying what research questions need to be asked, how to approach it, and then it can also be helpful in helping to maybe incentivize isn't the right word, but to attract and recruit and also retain participants in the research. So ideally, community partners would be involved throughout, even in the step of disseminating the research that comes out of it. And does a clinical partner include a community partner? Ideally, it would, yes. And so, as I was mentioning, part of the question is whether the investigator is experienced in doing community engaged research because it is important. Ideally, there would already be partnerships that the researcher has developed. Ideally, that would take place even before they apply for the funding so that they'll be able to incorporate that into their research questions as well as have an easier time recruiting people into the research study. I think that's one of the things to really look at is are we engaging typical clinical partners, and we're calling them community engaged partners. I mean, I think that's something that I've seen a trend more is that people are engaging um, dominant clinical institutions and then calling them community engaged research. And I, I, not that that's bad necessarily, but it's not necessarily advancing the field in the same way, I think. Um, could you also define what you meant by at risk? So you said there were new and at risk it was a program right. announcement 
too. So at risk of not having enough funding to be able to continue a research program. So Got ensuring that people somebody, have enough support. Somebody who's already been funded, but then kind of helping them keep their program of research yes, going. Exactly. Okay. Um, and the last question I have is, I am aware that NIH at one point had, I don't know if they were T's or some type of training grant that was only open to minority serving institutions, because I understood T32s are dominant in non-minority serving institution are, are ones that they can't compete in the same way. Is that something, was that an error that I heard that there used to be that type of funding? And that it no longer exists, or is there? I'm not any... familiar with that program at the moment. We're participating in the NIH parent announcement for T32, but I can certainly look into the history and dig into it'd that. Be, and get I'd be back curious to, to see if there's another mechanism that something just so that they would maybe compete in a different way. So, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your questions. Yeah, I don't know if our program staff um, know the answer to that. Um, they can maybe figure out how to chime in. Um, Suchi, I, I just wanted to follow up on your question about clinical partners. Mm -hmm. Was there a specific initiative or something that you heard that you were wondering about that related to? It's more just trends that I'm seeing in terms of how people are defining community-engaged research. So it isn't any one specific thing, but rather you just see um, you know, large hospitals that are used to working with R1 institutions that are just relabeling themselves as community engaged. So I have a question, um, Betty Beckmeyer at the University of Washington. Um, so thank you, Dr. Lauda, and thanks for those who've been on this task force. This is all super exciting stuff. Um, I have a couple of questions about um, a couple of the um, initiatives that are sort of, to me, feel bigger and system-wide kind of things to take on. Um, one is the um, enhancing the structure of research grants and and um, saying a little bit, are there other, um, do you have uh, other things in the works or ways of thinking about um, a wish list of other changes and structures that you you all have considered around like um, changing deadlines so things aren't as as hurried for people um, or um, making it more possible to support um, community engaged research it's often hard to sort of provide um, supports for for some sort of for folks etc and then the other one is um, mitigating bias in the grant review process so um, some of your ideas around that are super exciting, but I'm also thinking, is there a wish list there around um, um, training new cohorts of, of people in the grant review process, maybe from minority serving institutions or, um, you know, the how we're going to really change the grant review process in terms of sort of bringing on new and different people into the process, I think. Do you have things like that on those on your wish list? So, yes, those are very great ideas. And those are, <laughs> no. All right, try again. Those are great ideas. One thing that the Center for Scientific Review is doing is recruiting more early career reviewers and with a focus on making sure that there is a diverse group brought onto that. And so that will help overall with hopefully allowing people to have more opportunities to get these experiences. And in terms of the grant structures, a lot of the initiatives I shared today are very new, like maybe just posted last month. And so they really are new activities that we are doing. So in addition, Thinking about the research grant processes is something that is directly addressed in the recently released NIH-wide DEIA strategic plan. And there's also an RFI request for information that was recently released related to our process for research grant applications, with the idea being that we want to try to make it maybe shorter if possible 
easier and more straightforward and maybe even streamlined. So at the level of the agency overall, these discussions are taking place. And I was actually on the writing group that helped to create the NIH-wide DEIA strategic plan. So we had a lot of discussions about all of these dis different issues that are faced right now. There was a request for information that contributed to the content of that strategic plan so that ideas like what you're raising today were considered and factored into that plan. And so we would look forward to being able to continue participating in the process overall, possibly through the implementation phase for the NIH-wide plan. And so we're doing this as part of a collective so that we can all be moving together as an agency and on the same page. Thank you. In re reflecting on the community engagement uh, issue, um, some uh, RFAs, especially for special calls or proposals um, and initiatives uh, to, uh, regarding uh, projects with um, Native American communities require community-based participatory research, CBPR, yes. as a, and guidance around it and really demonstrate that that is the approach and part of the structure of the proposal. So some of that might be if it's provided in some of the guidance uh, as a requirement may help to mitigate some of that issue around. Absolutely. And so we did have one in particular that I'm thinking of that NINR signed on to a 2020 funding opportunity specifically for participants of Native American descent. And then we have other funding opportunities where it's required, not just a health disparities focus, but required to include individuals from health disparities populations. So that would be an area where we would hope to continue expanding. I was also going to thank you for this. I really, I, I was part of one of the working groups and it's so nice to see um, all of this work that's gone into it since our work was concluded and, and it's great to see action happening and action planned uh, and more questions emerging as it goes forward. Um, part of, um, one of the things that I was noticing within this, and this reflects back to our discussions in the working group, uh, we had this balance of, okay, what what kinds of recommendations can we make, or what kinds of themes can we identify that are actionable versus those that we're, we don't know how they might be implemented. And it's, I think that is, uh, I think it's important to continue to address both. There were some very concrete things that uh, you're able to point to that were actionable, uh, but other ones, like some of these more structural, like with the way grant funding is structured, with the way CSR is uh, operates, that are much more longer term, bigger changes. And I think those are critical to keep um, keep revisiting. And just because we don't see an easy way to resolve them now, uh, doesn't mean that those solutions won't become more, uh, we'll have more vision and clarity about them in the future. So I think just continuing to come back to these things one of the other things I noticed is um, some of these, some of the responses and some of the actions that are uh, currently underway or have been underway are pretty short term. Uh, like one example is like the, uh, and this, we struggle with this in our institution, we saw the supplements for DEI mentorship, uh, which like looked like a fantastic opportunity. And I believe this is the one I'm thinking of that until you look at it and it's a one year thing. And right. so people who would have been fantastic or would have made a lot of sense, we're too busy doing the DEI mentorship work to, to, to do something for a short, short term thing. So I guess making sure that through these processes, there are ways to evaluate success, but part of that success is saying, how is this sustainable? How is this making sure things, these efforts are not one and done, check we did something for this, but really mm -hmm. how can this change uh, things going forward? And hearing your presentation, I'm confident that those discussions are part of these evaluations and I just encourage that that uh, stay as a salient discussion point. So thank you. Thank you very much for that feedback. Yes. I think one thing that can happen is although administrative supplements are typically one year, potentially two, depending on the opportunity, that we can reissue funding opportunities. So I agree it will be important to think about how to reach even more institutions to make sure that they're aware of these opportunities. 
So I'll pause and see if anyone uh, online wants to jump in. Dr. Sullivan, Provencio Vasquez, Fitzpatrick. Okay. Any last minute thoughts, Dr. Lauman? Yes, I just wanted to say that there were many touch points with NIH funding in my career, including training grants, diversity supplement, an F31 award that really helped me to complete my graduate training, postdoctoral training, and ultimately arrive here to be able to have this kind of impact. So I'm very excited and excited to be working with all of you. Thank you so much for our discussion today. Yeah, really appreciate uh, Council's further reflections on these areas. We agree there's much more to do and we're committed to doing it. So thank you so much for sharing um, those thoughts with us. And Dr. Brennan is here. Dr. Brennan, do you mind if we take a five oh, minute break? Yeah. All right, while well, you get set up. All right, so let's um, try to be back at about 23 or so, which we know will be 25 or so. So let's let's try that. All right, thanks. Welcome back. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next guest speaker, Dr. Patricia Brennan. It's a pleasure. Um, so Dr. Patricia Brennan, as you all know, is the director of the National Library of Medicine at NIH. NLM is a leader in biomedical in informatics and computational health data science research, and the world's largest biomedical library. Since joining NLM in 2016, she has positioned it as a global scientific research library with visible and accessible pathways to research and information that is universally actionable, meaningful, understandable, and useful. This ensures that scientists, policymakers, clinicians, patients, and the public can access biomedical information when and where they need it. Dr. Brennan led the development of Digital NIH, the NIH's first long-range vision of the information technology needed to support the NIH mission. Along with the NIH Acting Chief Information Officer, Dr. Brennan guides the implementation of Digital NIH, overseeing four implementation planning teams and working with NIH leadership to create a more robust and responsive IT governance and funding strategy. Dr. Brennan is the first nurse, industrial engineer, and woman to be NLM director. Her unique career path guides her approach to integrate health information management with artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning to advance the future of healthcare. We are proud to also host Dr. Brennan's lab. Um, she is an adjunct investigator in the advanced visualization branch within the NINR division of intramural research. So I will turn the meeting over to Dr. Brennan as she gives us an overview of NIH's strategy of harnessing the power of AI tools like chat GBT. GBT, GPT maybe. Okay, thank you, Dr. Brennan. Thanks very much, Shannon. And thank you very much for the time to speak to the council. The development of a strategic plan for anything requires a lot of engagement across a lot of people. This period of time to talk to councils is very important because we need your input for the directions that NIH is going to be taking. Now, Shannon asked me to talk a little bit about um, what's going on with ChatGPT, and, and so I've got a little couple of remarks to make about that, and I can't help but brag about the outstanding work going on in my research lab. So we have a short video at the end to show you about some of the work that's going on in our advanced visualization virtual reality laboratory. Um, I wanna thank the parts of the advanced visualization branch that are now listening in and thank Fed for his support because this is really a great team project. Um, the National Library of Medicine has been uh, the source of information and data for the campus for many years, over 50 years. But I want to give you a little bit of history. We came from the Department of the Army. And so we were actually, we, we, we predate the, the NIH. We were founded in 1836. And when in 1956, the generals thought that we need to move this library into the public health service so everyone could have access to it, they tried to figure out where to put it. And they thought about maybe Cleveland or maybe Chicago or maybe San Francisco, which city had good transportation, likely to have a good industrial base, likely to have medical schools, and unlikely to be bombed. 
And for some reason, they decided at the end to put it here where we were likely to be bombed, at least in the Cold War time, they thought that. So I want you to look at our beautiful building here. This is the building on the edge of campus close to Bethesda. And you'll notice that short building in the front with the weird roof, that's called a hyperbaric parabola. And it's a glass roof. It's like, it's like living in a snow globe, actually. Tall building in the back is one of our research buildings. We have other space on campus and off campus. But look at the building from it. Look at those skinny little lines. Those are actually windows. Now, the idea was this. If a bomb was dropped on the Pentagon, it would perpetuate up Wisconsin Avenue. It would come through the Bethesda. It would hit that corner right below the flag. And then it would be directed around the building, up those little windows. And the top would slam down and seal the books. And so it would seal the knowledge of all history. <laughs> well, it turns out, not true. The physics are wrong. Turns out this building has 17 inch thick walls and 14 inch thick floors. So managing it is a mess. And it turns out that actually we thank God didn't need to know anything about the bomb. Um, but we are a, a library designed to preserve knowledge. We began, as I said, in 1836, um, a field army hospital surgeon asked for a, a, a books from the surgeon general to help with his work. And through the years, our building moved around. We were, for a short while, some of our holdings were in Cleveland at the Allen Memorial Library. Uh, didn't want to give them back. We had to fight that one. Um, then we moved to the to a, the, what's called the, the Red Main Building on, on the, the Smithsonian Mall, which is down where the um, Herschel Museum is now. Um, there were no ladies' rooms in that building, by the way, for some reason. I don't know why. Um, and we were we moved out to campus, and at that time we were really thought of as a fairly traditional library. We held books, we held journals. When you look at back at our building, um, you'll see that our our building actually extends four stories underground. We have 65 miles of shelving in there. In the 60s, though, we began to, to really embrace computer technology. Our, our early thinkers thought we could, this would be a great way to manage the volume, volume of knowledge for healthcare. Some of you remember Index Medicus, those big red volumes that you had to go and use. So we they used to we used to we used to drive them, print, generate them on computers, and then print them on paper. We don't do that anymore. Um, but during the 60s also, we developed our two research enterprises, the Lister Hill National Center for Biomedical Communications, which was looking at advanced communication technologies, everything from video disk to satellite uh, technology to communicate uh, the health information around the world. And then in the 80s, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, which is where our genomic repositories are and now where, where exists PubMed. Um, since the 2000, under the, the vision of Dr. Donald Lindbergh and then my own activities, we've really been pushing more towards the 21st century library, which is the intersection of knowledge and data, the ability to have information trusted, ac accessible everywhere. So um, you know us best, though, through our, our products and services. At the top, we have PubMed and PubMed Central, our literature and citation repositories. Going around, we have our genomic databases, a lot of consumer information, including clinicaltrials.gov and daily med, uh, resources for interlibrary loan. And in a typical federal structure, we are allowed to charge for interlibrary loan to get articles out to people, but we're not allowed to keep the money. So we, we spend a million dollars a year, send, we collect a million dollars a year for interlibrary loan services, then we have to pay it back to the treasury. Um, doesn't make sense to me either. Um, but one of the things you may not know about us is that we are the U.S. Repository for Health Data Standards. So we, we hold the uh, SNOMED, uh, the LOINC and RX norms terminologies that are used for meaningful use of clinical healthcare IT. And the relationship happened around 2000 when in collaboration with the Department of Health and Human Services, we became a repository to allow free access to formal terminology. So that has really accelerated computationally based healthcare. Uh, and important for us that we've also learned a lot about computers and network systems. We manage one of the two internet points, internet two points of presence on the campus, and we have uh, resources that are used millions of times a day. So we've learned a lot about security, interoperability, and APIs. Uh, today I'm here mostly, excuse me. I'm here mostly to talk with you about the, the building of the digital NIH vision. NIH never had a strategic plan for information technology. It allowed each institute and center to, center to build out what they thought was appropriate. About 10 years ago, we built an, a strong network backbone, but still had a highly disparate system. So we began about two years ago in a series of meetings with over 400 people on the campus to create a vision of the future. And that vision was driven by the idea that technology and science are becoming inseparable. You can't really do science even community-based science without some kind of technology, and certainly some of our high-performance computing, our, our, our genomic assays require a high level of computation. Recognizing that the role of technology in science is changing, it's no longer the add-on we think about at the end of a program, but it's something that drives us from the beginning, but that achieving the new promise of technologies for the NIH is gonna require us to think about funding it differently. We can no longer allow institutes and centers that have money to do what they want and institutes and centers that don't have money to be stuck. 
So we're looking for a common platform to support interoperability, to support connections, end-to-end -end agreement. And this came from our interviews with these 400 people. And we learned that people's expectations of technology are shifting. They expect to have technology available in my house right now to do whatever I need to do. So Digital NIH brings forward this vision that says a adaptive governance model will align institute and center specific technology investments with trans NIH investments and the trans NIH mission to ensure that every dollar spent on information technology on this campus advances the mission of the NIH. Um, this, we, we not only talked to over 400 people on campus, but we also met with about 20 institutions around the country, Howard Hughes, um, DARPA, some large medical centers, to understand how they were handling technology management. And we learned that everybody is focusing on the same thing. We need to grow faster with less money. Standards and architecture are becoming increasingly important as a way, if you will, a framework to hang things on. So our vision for the digital NIH is a more enterprise savvy approach to technology governance and decision making. That means we will invest in the technologies that advance the missions of the NIH as well as advance the IC missions that will include, as you see across the bottom, computational and data management strategies, ensuring that each IC is able to be at the forefront of the technologies that they need. So what the American, sorry, the National Cancer Institute needs is different than what the NINR needs. And we need to be able to tolerate local development while supporting enterprise wide. Um, we need to improve the, effic the operational efficiencies of the scientific processes. We, pro we manage over 100,000 applications every year. We have over 50,000 active grants, tracking them, making sure they're on time, making sure they're compliant is a challenge. And we need to have frameworks that can be more cost effective. There's no question the cost of technology is rising faster than the cost of science. So we built this framework not around an institute and center specific model, but around a functional model. And we have three key functional areas and then a cross-cutting support area. First, extramural research program management. This is not conducting research in the extramural program, but how do we manage all the things, our program officers, staff, our compliance officers, our research program cost managers. Uh, second, intramural clinical and basic research. And third, administration and management, which makes the NIH engine run. And if we can do that well, we can do everything else well. And there, finally, there are cross-cutting capabilities that is needed everywhere, security, workforce development architecture. So we built this, the implementation planning structure around these four areas. In the extramural program management group, we envision the capabilities that are needed. That is what has to be done, not the technologies to do it, but what has to be done is to enhance ERA, our electronic research administration system, to conduct comprehensive uh, holistic program reviews. We need technologies to help implement critical, critical policies, compliance, accessibility, and attention to early stage investigators. We need AI and machine learning systems that can help us monitor our programs, making sure our clinical trials are on target, making sure we're, our accrual rates are what they need to be in a way that is efficient. And finally, we need to show good stewardship of the, of the, the resources that NIH has been given. What will happen if we can build these capabilities is we will have a cutting edge integrated digital management, digital platform for portfolio management. We'll be able to reduce researcher and staff burden. The number of staff hours that go into assigning research grants to reviewers right now are counted in the weeks, not in hours, and we need to move it down to hours. And finally, we need to streamline the, the planning and tracking of the grants life cycle. For the intramural basic and clinical research, this is a big part of our enterprise. It's largely, but not exclusively here on campus. Our researchers told us they need better chance opportunities to collaborate with other researchers. They would like to see IRP, intramural program-wide software licensure, as opposed to buying 27 different licenses for the same piece of software, um, and perhaps for slightly different variants of the same piece of software. Uh, certainly, we need to become more sophisticated in how we support clinical trials on campus. Our clinical trials on campus are unusual because they tend to be smaller, and of one studies, mechanistic studies, but still have the same reporting requirements for clinical trial oversight. And finally, we need increased computing power. Everyone wants more computing for larger data sets. So if this works, our researchers will be able to know who else is doing research in their area on the campus. This will be great. The researchers will be able to design, conduct, and manage studies in one streamline, not in multiple different pathways. And importantly to this audience, patient reported needs will be included as, as, the core, as some of the core data in NIH studies. With respect to administration and management, this is where everybody yawns a little bit, but let me tell you, these are really important because we need management programs that can be translated to the into IC specific needs. I have 1,700 staff in my operation, NINR has less than that, NCI has more than that. So we need different kinds of administrative tools, we need different kinds of management tools, we need to be able to, to visualize where are our staff deployed, what are they doing, how do we supervise in new ways with this distributed model. 
um, automation and learning systems tools. The most challenging piece we heard when we talked to people is that I only use this particular utility once and I can never remember how to use it. So I have to go back through the whole training system to do that. We need in the moment on the job learning for these, some of these complex systems. And if this happens, we will have efficient business processes, which are rare in the federal government, I must confess. Um, and, and for common administrative actions, not, not requiring everyone to do the same thing the same way and only those things, but for common administrative actions, doing them the same way. And believe it or not, we still have a fair amount of manual processing, so we're trying to eliminate manual processing. Um, with respect to cross-cutting capabilities, these might be the most interesting ones because they address the general problems of computing in any complex environment. Common architecture, lightweight standards that people can build to. This will allow our ICs to build off of rather than building competition with the rest of the campus. Uh, innovative cutting edge analytics and computer computational infrastructure, again, should not be rebuilt in every single IC, should be a, an enterprise resource. We need a technically competent workforce of two types. The, tech, the technologies that institute directors or program managers need to have are fairly focused in mostly applications area, but we also need an IT workforce that can envision quantum computing, that can understand what we're going to do if we actually had a disruption of the commercial cloud market that we're all building into right now. We need that workforce here. And finally, we need risk-based embedded uh, cybersecurity protections. If we have this, and we're made, we've made huge progress this year already, establishing standards for interoperability and modernized technological solutions. So we're building towards an enterprise savvy net framework that'll, go that'll improve governance, will imp improve data storage for the campus and support at the IC level as well as across the NIH. This constant message of moving from ICs to the enterprise and back again is really critical for getting work done here. So we, we've envisioned this, that our plan is a five-year plan starting off with identifying these capabilities. What do we need to get our work done? And they, now we're prioritizing them, putting in a, a roadmap. We'll be getting doing some pilot projects over the summer. We've started to make progress on standards and a big, pro, big step in progress on governance. I can talk about that in a few minutes. Um, we're then uh, in the next few years, we'll be doing refinement and integration. As we have success stories, we'll build out, integrate into our, our living systems. Where we have failures, we'll kill them off and kill them early. In this path, we, we released the digital NIH uh, to the IC directors in uh, December. They, we got their approval in January, and we started our process. We now have four implementation planning teams involving over 90 NIH staff members. We have, it's, with the capabilities portfolios are, have been established, and now we're moving to the step of prioritizing and road mapping, recognizing that the most important thing might still take us three years to do. So it's going to be a long road. road in. The, some urgent things, there were some things we could get done quickly, may not be quite as important. So we have to trade off the speed and timeliness. And this has got to be done at the enterprise conversation level, not at the IC level. So we've had a huge project management staff supporting us with this. We'll be uh, doing pilot projects that they need to submit by August so we can award in this year's fiscal dollars, because as we all know, federal money is one year money. Uh, I'm going to keep hitting the wrong button. Okay, so um, by doing this, the science, the science will grow at NIH. And this is really why we're here. We're really trying to improve science driven by and empowered through technology. And that part is, is so critical to remember that the fundamental reason why we're having these conversations is to, to do this. So I'm gonna pause for a minute and have you think a little bit about with me, what can NINR do to help bring this strategy to life across the campus? There are things that we as a campus must do, the top three on the left. We need to treat technology as a mission critical resource, not as an afterthought, or as one of my other IC directors said to me, well, my, my laptop works fine. And I think that, that's not the infrastructure we're worried about there. Um, uh, that was a man here, by the way. Um, uh, we need to apply a holistic and collaborative planning approach to create innovative solutions. And that's, there's a lot in that sentence. This is a new challenge for NIH to look at holistic and collaborative planning in the context of in IC urgency, but still uphold the unique needs from the specific ICs. And NI, NINR has unique needs. You are reaching into communities in ways that NIH hasn't done before. You think about data elements that NIH hasn't been dealing with before. So some of the things that may be useful to think about is to con consider a way to, to partner where you can not have to build your own things. And I think NINR has been particularly good in this area, making use of other resources, but serve as a center of, of excellence around the things that NINR does best in their science mission. Um, support our implementation planning teams, and in particular, the implementation planning teams are reaching out and creating work groups. And a work group that we need that's particularly important is how do we build a bridge between the community engagement and the NIH level engagement in a safe and secure fashion? Because once you open a firewall, you've opened to risk. So there's a, some challenges there. And then we need to understand from NIR what research could be done if we had 
better architecture for you, if we had better a- analytics for you. That science is the responsibility of the N- NINR to, to decide. Along the way, we are also in the process of building a strategic plan for data science. The graphic on the screen in front of you shows you the, the relationship between these two. The blue lines and dots is digital NIH. I think of us as the pipes and boxes. We are connecting, we are, we are engaging. But the green, the NIH strategic plan for data science is addressing issues like data storage and security of the data storage, data science methods and tools, and data discovery and novel applications. And you'll be really excited to see one part of this, I guarantee you. The strategic plan for data science is just being resolved now. It's, it's in draft form. And there are five key goals, but the one most important to this group is number two, programs to enhance human-derived data for research. NIH has never taken a systematic approach to look at human-derived data, whether it comes from EHRs or comes from community observation or comes from patient-reported outcomes. So there, we have a commitment in the next five years in the data end to pay attention to data that's uniquely and, f- and deeply familiar to the NINR community. Um, in addition, uh, the strategic plan for data science is going to build this capabilities to sustain the data management sharing plan, improve operational analytics, um, recognize, and this is, this is important um, to align with the, the, the digital NIH, a federated biomedical research data infrastructure. We're not going to build one giant data lake for all the data that NIH deals with. We have to deal with interconnections and interoperability. And finally, to strengthen the broader community of data scientists. Their, uh, their goals are supported by cross-cutting themes, two of which are particularly important to this community. The lower left-hand side integrate ethics, policy, health equity, and transparency into the data science solutions. Sounds great, right? Nobody knows how to do it. Nobody even knows what it really means. So this community that deals so much more closely with the experience of a wide variety of humans can help inform in this area. Um, and secondly, uh, the top middle, integrate increased data discovery and broaden the use of clinical and healthcare data while preserving patient rights. And that gets very confusing when you get to people whose first language is in English, when you get to Native American communities or communities where, where community decision making is, is, is on par with individual decision making. So we have lots to learn from you. Um, if, you if you have questions about digital NIH, you can reach out to me. Uh, Susan Gregorick is in charge of the, uh, the NIH uh, data science strategy. That's a little more, um, it, we work very closely together, but we, we sort of know our own areas. I'm the wires lady and she's the, she's the data person. I'm going to take some questions at the end, but I'd like to take a few minutes to, to, to address some of the things that Shannon also asked me. Well, could you just comment a little bit about this? What's been on our mind lately? Generative AI, large language models, and chat GPT. It will not save us. I guarantee you it's not going to save us, but it will be useful to us. So um, this presentation is drawn from one of my staff at the NLM, Diane Babsky. She does super work. She brought forward these questions, and she said, is there hyper hope? And the main thing people worry about is, of course, hallucinations. Like, what are these AI me- mechanisms, particularly chat GPT? My brother put my name into chat GPT. I had a fabulous career Nothing like anything I ever did, but it was a very good. I was also dead, by the way. Um, it's also, but what's important is to understand that that we are now moving from a time where we asked our young scholars to generate new information, to generate hypotheses, to generate papers. Now they have to become equally skilled at the critical thinking and evaluation of the clarity, of the accuracy, of the appropriateness of what's being done. Um, Generative, uh, GPT rather is defined as a generative pre-trained transformer. It's a well-known, well-established approach in machine learning. It's been around for about eight or nine years. What happened in November is there was a human interface that was so easy to use, suddenly it became useful to everybody. So what looked like a revolution over a couple days really wasn't. Um, The generative part is that it, it creates something increasing, something new by learning from old patterns. It has no idea what it's creating. There is no self-reflection. Generative AI programs don't know if they're accurate or inaccurate. They don't know if they're biased or non-biased. They, these large language models, which are simply a, a reference to the billions of data points that are interconnected, that's the large language piece of it, the data or text, um, can create, can predict what the next word in a sentence should be, what the next sen- what the next sentence after a sentence should be by learning from the past conversation. It doesn't have any idea what that sentence means, but it knows what it, it could, what, how it should be spelled. So uh, what this makes this difference, the conversational language, some creative outputs are coming. I have a video of me taken from a, a Dali that I, I had a, quite a dancing career, apparently, on the Internet. Um, and, and there's a high versatility. And remember, these tools are already out and being used. Patients are already using them. So we can't shut the door. We have to figure out how to partner with them. 
um, the, 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 the things that could be useful and we could get, if we manage these properly, better analysis of data sets, patterns that we don't usually see, new ideas and new hypotheses that we don't have to figure are they worth exploring or valid, assisting in design, imagine the ability to, in the moment, modify a clinical trial strategy and facilitate development of new drugs and materials. These are all wonderful things. For the most part, we're not quite there yet, but we may be getting there soon and where scientists need to collaborate with them. Um, I'd like to show you if it's going to work for me. One of the things that we did was to say, well, what if a patient decided to use ChatGPT to help in self-management? My laboratory works on self-management of patients. So here we have it. We asked ChatGPT to suggest a diet for an elderly female on a sodium-restricted diet. Are we? Do, does this video run, guys? Have you seen this one run? Uh, yeah, there it goes. Okay, so we say, okay, plan this diet out here. And this is coming, in, this, is, this is a video, but it's in the moment being developed. An elderly female who has to reduce sodium. And so here's the recommendations that come. Not so, so bad, avoid processed foods, add spices. Um, you, you know, this wouldn't be an advanced practice nurse, but it's for somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about, it's a good first pass. Use sodium substitutes, not if they've got too much additives, but that's a different issue. Uh, try cooking at home. Here's some ideas about what you can. I mean, so this is the this is not pre-trained on anything but a large data sets. So it's out there for patients to get out and use. And so we can't pretend that they're waiting for us to tell them come ahead and use this. Um, it's a little scary. Um, you can tell it to make a better meal. You can tell it to make a vegetarian meal. You can tell it to do a lot of things. And then you then you realize you spend an hour on the internet that has absolutely no purpose in life whatsoever. Um, then, so there are limitations in the scientific landscape. It's important to remember that this is an uncharted territory. Uh, there's a Supreme Court case coming up to determine whether or not ChatGPT can be uh, can receive a patent. Um, there is, I'm sorry, sorry to tell you, there are 14 citations in PubMed that have ChatGPT as a co-author. Don't like this one. That's up to the journals. The journals have said you can't do that. But here are some things to be thinking about. What is attribution? What is the intellectual property? What what can, where, what do we, can we bring forward from the machine? Which machine was this generated on? We have a whole chain of trust to learn to be developed. And by the way, this entire list was developed by ChatGPT, if you see at the bottom. Um, you, my slides will be available if you want to see in more depth. Just in closing, I want to remind you that the journals are stepping up and they're starting to give some guidance to our scientists. And they're saying no authorship unless you meet the criteria of an authorship, which is the ability to reflect on an article and to stand by it intellectually. And ChatGPT cannot do that. Um, I am going to be reachable. I have a blog that comes out every Wednesday morning, and you have my email there. But I'm going to take my last minute and just show you what we've been doing in my lab. My lab is the Advanced Visualization Branch. Uh, thanks to the NINR for their early uh, and encouraging support. We are using virtual reality to help people to learn how to help people better take care of themselves. And one of the things we, we recognize is that people who, they, when they leave a clinician's office and are told follow this diet. By the time they get to the grocery store, they have no idea. What, what does that actually mean? How do I plan a day? What is a portion size? So we built a virtual grocery to help people to, to understand where do people's cognitive skills help them and get in the way? Do distractions matter? Does it structure or not structure matter? The worst thing you can do, by the way, is send a research participant into the virtual grocery store without a list because they don't know what to do. They wander around. Oh, just like people do, right? So we have, we have a lot of options here. But anyway, here's what we've been doing. And this is this is welcome silent. to the oh, advanced visualization branch of the National Institute of Nursing Research. And welcome to the AVB lab grocery store, where we study how virtual reality environments allow participants to practice problem solving during everyday activities to improve health outcomes. Participants navigate through the environment using teleportation. This occurs in a controlled community-like setting with obstacles and distractions. We can collect data on that their one. movement through the store. Participants select products from the shelves and add them to their shopping cart. We can use eye tracking to follow a participant's gaze. For example, knowing where they look on the nutrition label. Participants can compare products side by side and make informed decisions. In addition to environmental measures, we collect questionnaire data about their experiences. The environments created for VR have enough realism for immersion, but also enough adaptability to be adjusted for different kinds of inclusive test conditions and requirements. 
Thank you for shopping at the AVB. Thanks for letting me share that. I'm so proud of our group. We've started to bring uh, the participants in. Uh, we, we learn a lot about um, uh, the first pass. People can tolerate being in VR. That's really important. Um, they wear the head mounted device. You saw that. We also have learned that um, structure is really important. So when you think about patient education, a little bit of structure on patient outreach is probably going to be the most important intervention nurses can do. So I think I'm in my time. Thank you very much, Shannon and the committee, and thank you for your interest. Thank you so much. So I've asked Dr. Lee to lead us in discussion. Yeah, so our sincere thanks, Dr. Brennan, for a wonderful and comprehensive overview of digital NIH and a glimpse into chat GPT and potentially um, aspects of how that might intersect with all of our work. And thanks so much for your leadership on uh, digital NIH. Um, I do have a question about the NIH strategic plan for data science that you may be able to address, and I know okay. that it's kind of emerging. but. Um, a lot of us might be interested in goal one, the focus on the capabilities yes. to sustain kind of the data management and sharing policy. So can you just talk a little bit more on that? Um, and again, this can just be kind of your current thinking on it. Are the capabilities really focused on like increasing repository kind of diversity and availability, given that that's an additional requirement, like without any additional increase in budget, or are there other kind of capabilities that are kind of on the table? So the, the first thing is we, we work very closely with the Office of Science Policy and the Office of Extra Research, who are the two leads in the implementation of the data management and sharing policy. Uh, it does relate to our intramural researchers also. That's being handled in a slightly different way. The um, focus from the, the strategic plan for data science with respect to this is focusing on, the, on metadata. So how do we label the data in a way that makes it accessible and reusable? Uh, con consent management, how do we keep the provenance of the data available so that we know uh, what, whether this data can or cannot be used and for what purposes, and then repository identification. Um, our particular issue with repositories is, uh, is how to deal with repositories for controlled access data. Most of the, we have many repositories for, for uncontrolled data, that is uh, data that doesn't generate from humans. Um, the, the sequence read archive is a big one that I manage. There's also uh, uh, Figshare and Zenodo uh, in the community, these can accept data that are not protected. That is, they're not human data. But once you get to human data, there's increasing challenges. So we're looking to see what is the right structure. Um, NICHD has taken the approach to set up a IC-specific repository. To be very honest, that scares me some, because not all research is containable within one IC, and it may not be, we, we need to work on other approaches to access and, and, and to uh, discover that data. Um, I do not, I, if, if I could stop ICs from setting up their own repositories, I would, and start to look for repositories that may be shared scientific values or maybe have some shared uh, strategies for access, most likely to be used for policy, most likely to be used for research. Um, but it's, it, is a, it is a big open area, and we do recognize that any dollar you spend on data management is a dollar off your direct costs that you could spend on participant engagement, and so it's a challenge. All right. All right. Thank you very much for your comments. And then regarding the chat GPT, first, I love that the list of the limitations of AI was in itself generated by yes. AI, so that's fabulous. <laughs> so um, one of the generative AI capabilities that you mentioned was um, as a, a benefit is to generate new ideas and hypotheses um, and potentially leading to new discoveries. So with public health in mind, that sounds absolutely fabulous, and I think we would all agree. Um, where there is concern is, you know, even in the grant submission process, where are those ideas coming from? Are yep. part, of, part of grants that have already been funded, AI generated, chat GPD generated. So we have a little bit more regulation in the publication from the two sources that you mentioned, you know, IC, MJE, and WAME in terms of guidelines for authorship. But what's your current thinking about even grants being submitted that potentially are entirely or at least in part AI generated and the role that that may play in kind of the future of even funding? Uh, so, first of all, the, the, the accountability for what is submitted is with the PI. So, the, 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 we, we, have, um, we have not changed our accountability model. What we do need to better understand is the discernment. And any of you who've done a grant review know when you get to that three pages of citations at the end, you glaze over and you don't look at that. So, one of the tools we're looking at is how do we provide a quick tool for validating the, the citations. Um, that in itself would be, would be quite useful. Um, the question about should ChatGPT be allowed to generate a hypothesis, and if so, how do we footnote it? How do we note that? Is, is it is an open discussion right now? Um, if you think about 
having coffee with a colleague and getting an idea. You don't actually necessarily footnote that idea. So it, the, 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 the challenge for us, and I'm not talking about journal publication, right now, I'm talking about grant submissions. The challenge for us is to what extent do we expect a, an accountability for a train of logic or a train of reasoning? And if an investigator says, I did this myself, but actually I was in the shower yesterday and I thought of this idea, or I did this myself, but I was drawing and I had this idea, we, we, have, we, we have decided, okay, we don't need to know that part, but we do need to know, and I think what we might be seeing is, is a self-declaration of the amount of assistance one has used and the types of assistance one has used in, in generating an idea. But the responsibility for the submission remains the accountability of the, the principal investigator. That will not change. All right. All right. Fascinating insights as always, so thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm happy to open it up to my colleagues' questions or comments. Yeah, I, I, we were having an interesting discussion about this among some journal editors, actually. Yes. And um, one of the things that occurred to me is that we are fairly comfortable with people citing that the statistical analysis was performed by SPSS. Um, and we don't think that that somehow abrogated the responsibility of the person who was actually directing uh, the project or directing the analysis. So it, we may get and I don't know how concerned to be about chat GPT, but um, it does occur to me that we already use a lot of decision-making and analytical tools in mm -hmm. research already. Well, it, it, that's a terrific one to start with, Cindy. And I, I think it's important to think about this. When I say this ANOVA was run on SPSS, I am claiming that the variance generator that, that SPSS uses in this type of ANOVA is known to others and therefore is part of my chain of trust. If I were to say, I computed this ANOVA by myself, you don't know which variance generator I used. And so you actually have less information if I don't declare this. If I were to say, I, this, we used um, BMDP or R to, to run this ANOVA, their variance generators are different. And so the, 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 the skilled reviewer knows that they're different. The non-skilled reviewers, or the, there's no easy way for a reviewer who doesn't have that analytics sophistication to understand that there are two different variance generators and did, was the right one used and interpreted here. The challenge with, with the large language models is they're not as traceable and they're more what we would consider uh, stochastic. That is, they, they, they may produce different results to the same, the same prompt each time. And you may be hearing the phrase prompt engineering lately, which is how do you write a good prompt to get a, a generative uh, pre-trained transformer to give you an, an interesting and helpful answer. Um, what what I would say, and I, I, I'm a big advocate for this, the NIST, NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, has released something we're called the AI Risk Management Framework. This is document came out in um, August and April of this year. It's extraordinarily well done, and it, it takes the chain of development of an AI uh, solution, not just a generative one, but any AI solution, through the process of idea generation, a question that is, is the or purpose of, the, of this, data source, training process, training validation, you, uh, training uh, evaluation, and then transfer to new knowledge. So it's roughly seven steps. And it helps you identify the questions that should be asked at each step. So it's, it really is quite useful and I think quite friendly. I've used it with, uh, with clinical research groups where deciding the, val the validity of a question is a conversation between a clinical researcher and a clinician. Understanding the nature of the data requires that maybe the researcher and a medical informatics specialist. So, so there's different skills along the way, and our challenge now is documenting the chain of trust. But I think for journal editors in particular, having tools like this that help understand where there is, there's not a shorthand. We did this analysis using SPSS, so the whole lineage of SPSS comes along. is going to, I think, help the journal editors process some. Now, we were surprised that ICMJE did not come out against the generative pre-trained transformers, but actually was excited about them. Three reasons. Articles written by non-English speaking, people using languages and first, first languages in English, so can be translated into a scientific English. Mm, if you can evaluate the accuracy of the translation, maybe. I couldn't always do that with my own students. Um, the second piece, being able to, to rapidly critique a line of reasoning. And so they, the while, well, a generative AI program cannot tell if it made a mistake. It can look over the steps of an algorithm and tell if there's a step of that algorithm missing. So, there, so there's some assistance with more technical resources. And the, the third had to, to do with, with fraud and duplication. 
you know, does this idea, does this presentation match something that already exists? Um, what I don't like is what's coming out in Grammarly. Have any of you seen this now? You can get, you can get GPT put into your Grammarly so that in the moment it tells you a better way to write your sentence. I don't, I don't like that. It creeps me out. On that creepy note, does anyone else have questions or comments? Um, yeah, I have a question. Thank you so much for that, um, Dr. Brennan. This is Betty Beckmeyer at the University of Washington. We were talking earlier about um, community-engaged yes. research, and you touched on this. Like, it, it feels like that's still sort of out there, something that, um, how, that, that you'll have to be thinking about. How are we going to promote and deepen it? our community engaged research, but still sort of manage um, how we share data. Well, Can you say a little more about that? This is a special interest of mine. Um, I, I, you know, we're, in nursing, we're so well trained with our theoretical frameworks and concept analysis. And we understand that a concept reflects some real world phenomenon and you, you find indicators of that concept that have to match the real world phenomenon. So this makes perfect sense to me. I get a little nervous with the, with, with people who want to create common data elements because the numbers look the same and have no idea if the age of 17 means that that person is a high school graduate or that person is, pre, is, is not through brain development or that person can drive. So the age might've been something conceptually different in all those three studies. Now, when we get to community engaged research, I would expect by and large, we are going to need to look at the alignment of the research concepts with the community's definition of their, their the phenomenon. And we are going to need to look at the alignment of that with the, the disciplinary knowledge, in our case, nursing. Excuse me. So that three-part stool should be part of our research process. How do we show that this indicator means what the community thinks it means? And that this indicator also means what the research investigator believes it means, and that there's alignment between what the community thinks it's telling the researcher and what the researcher is trying to embed in the larger body of knowledge. I think that's a fundamentally more challenging approach to research than we currently have right now, because we talk now about alignment between a measure and a concept, but we don't add that third piece in about what does this mean to the person who gave us the answer. And um, in, in, my, in my own studies, I've had uh, people, when I've asked them, debriefed them about something that they've done. They said, well, I didn't want you to look bad. So I checked all the boxes on the right-hand side. Like that doesn't help us measure anything properly. So we have social desirability, lots of community trust to build. It's an exciting time for this, but it, our, our approaches to measurement are not going to straightforward translate into community engaged research. Hey, less chance. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. Thank that was great. So, so appreciate you joining us and sharing that. So um, we will move to our lunch break. Uh, so it is now 1210. Uh, let's reconvene at 1245 Eastern. So thank you. thank you. Welcome back to everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce our next guest speaker. Welcome to Dr. Deborah Duran. Dr. Duran is the Senior Advisor to the Director for Data Science, Data Analytics, and Data Systems at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. She advises the NIMHD Director on the state of the field and efforts at the levels of the NIH and HHS. She also coordinates, uh, assists in coordinating NIMHD efforts to obtain better representation of minorities and social determinants of health in large data sets, addresses biases in emerging technology, and enable NIMHD to have a voice in NIH efforts regarding data harmonization and management. Dr. Duran has been a key contributor to the increased emphasis on data science and common data elements at NIH in response to the pandemic and the emergent need to advance the use of big data to better understand how social determinants of health contribute to the syndemic disease burden. So I will turn the meeting over to Dr. Duran as she gives an overview of, new, of a new data sharing resource called the Science Collaborative for Health Disparities and Artificial Intelligence Bias Reduction or SHARE. So Dr. Duran, thanks for joining us. Um, thank you. Going to load up here. 
Dr. Duran, you want to start the there slide? We go. There we go. Um, thank you for having me today. I'm happy to um, please to show you this um, new cloud tool that was developed actually in conjunction with um, NINR and the Office of Data Science Strategy. So this is the office in, in the director of, OD, of NIH. And so in collaboration, the three of us have designed this um, platform to not only do research, but also to uh, mitigate bias in artificial intelligence. So the purpose of, of the platform, it's a cloud platform, Google, with a Terra interface. And it was designed really because in data science, there's an underrepresentation of women and populations with health disparities. <clears throat> so in order to increase that, we have to have tools that actually help raise the, their interest and their skill levels. We also designed this to do a paradigm shift in how we think of health disparities research and health, com health outcomes research, health care delivery research. We have to shift from from doing laptop type of research to a paradigm shift using big data. Because in big data, we actually learn more and also to um, mitigate biases in algorithms, wearable devices that use algorithms and any other tools in which we use big data and biases are inevitable. This actually fits into the perspective of NINR's um, strategic plan, dealing with health equity and the social determinants of health for research. SHARE deals with those um, aspects as well, and therefore we have a joint interest. Phase one of the SHARE platform was completed already. It is a the components of the SHARE platform consist of data sets. Most of the data sets are population science, including the social determinants of health, environmental, and behavior. It also has a data repository in which, as you know, NIH now has a data sharing policy, so it, will, it can host data from different projects. It has secure workspaces so that individuals can go into the cloud, use the cloud resources, both as an individual and in collective or collaborative teams. These workspaces are secure, so no one else can see the research or the data they're using, so it's safe and confidential. The cloud platform also has computational skills or um, tools and resources available to them that are free of charge so that we can make this a cost-effective uh, resource as well. And then of course, we are doing many things that will mitigate biases. It is a, as I said, a Google platform with the Terra interface. We also have the NIMHD webpage also hosts the shared portal which actually is the path into the cloud. There are three, we call it an ecosystem because there's three types of data that is hosted on the web, on the cloud. One is what we call Google Cloud Public Data Sets, also known as federated data sets. These are de-identified. There's no PII in any of these. And it includes things like the American Community Survey and many of the national data sets that um, are publicly available to everyone. The other type of data set that we host is what we call share hosted public data sets. And these are things like the behavioral risk um, survey, BRFS, because 
these data sets are not part of Google, or they're not part of Azure, and they're not part of AWS. So we can bring these data sets in on this cloud platform and integrate them into the whole ecosystem. And then the last part is the share hosted project data sets. These are can be projects both from the intramural program as well as the extramural program. So it is a place that can host both. An example that NIMHD has is the Jackson Heart Study. The data sets are organized by the social determinants of health categories from CDC, economic stability, education, healthcare access, neighborhood and built environments, and social and community. We also added the categories of health behaviors, disease, and conditions. These are an example of the, there's approximately 200 data sets that are currently on share. We are, have a plan for over 300 so that it covers environmental issues, every social determinants of health issue, and other types of population and behavioral um, topics. We're in discussion with uh, pulse oximeter data from um, that also uses EPIC from John Hopkins so that we can bring many of these types of things to look at bias mitigation as well as how the social determinants of health impact health. That is already done. We are in phase two, which is in process, and this phase two will be completed by the end of September. And in phase two, we are developing um, core common data elements that will enable us to better aggregate the data sets, not only from the project data, but also from, we're gonna map, um, map it from project data to federated data sets so that we can actually bring in the federated data sets and do analysis with projects. In this ecosystem, we hope to be able to map across data sets, federated data sets, and platforms. And in a minute, I'll explain what I mean by platforms. This is an example of how the core common data elements will help us map project data together. And this is the only repository at NIH that does this currently, or is planning to have this kind of integration currently. And this is why there was such a big investment by OD, because this is, this is becoming a model of how we can create better aggregated data sets. And as I said, the project data can also then be mapped to federated data sets. We're working now on a, uh, the American Community Survey, the Medical Expenditure Survey, and pharmacy and health insurance data sets. The plan is also for us to be able to map across platforms. And what I mean by platforms is at NIH, we have major cloud computing platforms like all of us, Biodata Catalyst and Anvil. We all use what we call the Terra interface. So you have a cloud um, and it could be Azure, it can be AWS, or it can be Google. But every one of those clouds have to have an interface where you can interact with the cloud itself. All of these platforms use Terra. We all use Terra because now we can integrate together. So, for example, when we are done and we're working with Biodata Catalyst now, you're going to be able to take that social determinants of health data and map it with the Biodata Catalyst um, data as well. And so you can have more of a comprehensive study. The same thing with, with ANVIL, which is genomics. And so you can end up doing epigenetic studies. Another sister program that we have to the SHARE platform is something that we are calling Thinkathons. And remember I told you that the women and populations that from health disparities are gravely underrepresented in data science. So we developed these instructional thinkathons 
to actually teach people how to use what data science is, how to use the Terra platform, because if they learn to use the Terra platform on, on the shared cloud, they can use it in all of us. They can use it in Anvil. They can, it's the same platform. So this actually increases their use and their skill level. We are in the phase of doing instructional thinkathons now. We're shortly moving into research thinkathons. So we're developing these collaborative research teams to actually practice and use big data across the spectrum of career level as well as disciplines. By doing that, where we will actually do what I call upskilling up and down across the platform because the younger people have more data science skills and the older investigators have more content knowledge skills and they're going to help each other um, cross discipline and in upskill both. They will stay together very similar to the N3C domain teams and finish a research project to publication. These thinkathons will also target bias mitigation, and we're actually doing special event thinkathons. So we just completed an educator event thinkathon, which targeted people who at minority, low resource minority serving institutions, so that they could use the share platform to teach their classes because many of these low resource institutions don't have the funds to create clouds like this. So by introducing them to this, they can teach their students using this platform. The next um, special event that we're gonna do is going to um, target the tribal nations and colleges, universities. And we're open to any other targeted population that you guys would like us to uh, do as well. This is an example of the underrepresentation. As you can see, females are only about 20%. And of the um, other than Asians, Hispanic, Black, Native Americans comprise less than 11% of the representation in data science. We also focus on bias mitigation because biases occur in every aspect. It's not like they can be eliminated, but we need to know how to, um, one, identify them, correct them, and then use um, communities to actually implement them in a way that doesn't create um, discrimination and harm to certain population groups. This is a way that you can get involved with SHARE. This is to get the news, the updates, the um, announcements that we have and when the next thinkathons are. And this is the links in order to both join SHARE and to join the thinkathons. And lastly, I would like to thank all of the, the vast amount of people that have been needed to make this a very successful project. And um, Dr. Zink is one of those that we are gravely appreciative to, as well as her staff, Rebecca House and Michael Still and John Grayson. So thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Duran. Um, so Dr. Ayala will lead us in discussion. Thank you, Dr. Duran. Guadalupe Ayala from San Diego State University. Really appreciate this presentation and the focus here on data and data sharing. Um, I'm curious about the um, Terra platform. Is this a platform that is easily accessible to anybody at any in academic institution? Yes, um, Terra is actually, was originally funded by NCI. It's housed at the Broad Institute. It is accessible to anybody. The reason that the cloud platforms at NIH use it is because we're able to better integrate if we're all using the same system. 
Awesome. Thank you. I'm still learning a lot of the language here. <laughs> um, the the one, I guess, concern that I that raises for me. So I, I'm an intervention researcher and I really think about context. And while I love the opportunity to bring data together, um, because more information usually helps us refine our interventions, I worry about it in this case because you're removing the context from the data unless is there a goal to try and maintain or contextualize the data that's being shared from projects? Are there certain variables that are going to be required to be shared? Can you discuss that at all? Well, I I think in the I think there's many answers to that. So it's not like a simple answer. For me, the idea of using the big data for things, like I'm going to use the social determinants of health as an example, because when you do local interventions, you're often targeting something in a, a particular neighborhood that you think will, um, let's say, increase vaccination rates or get people to do breast cancer screening. But in those kind of intervention studies, we usually focus on a couple of things. For me, the, the world of data science opens up a whole nother world of discovery because I can take the data using zip codes of all the social determinants of health that happen within a particular zip code. I can combine it to federated data sets of that same zip code for me to get a better understanding of what that community is so that when I run a data analysis, I can understand what social determinants of health are the me mechanistic pathways to why certain things happen. Once I understand that in a more comprehensive picture, I can better tailor my intervention for that local community. So I think in many ways, this will help intervention research to be more um, targeted on areas that that are identified as pathways. And Thank we don't you. have that kind of research in social determinants of health. Right. Yeah. We, or, or if it does, it's very local. It's, it's not, it, not yeah. combined in the way you're talking. Yes. Yeah. And so for me, this is going to open up a, a, a vast uh, amount of knowledge for us to actually make very meaningful interventions that we never even thought about. But I'm glad that you're interested so that you can also then do these studies. Oh, no, definitely. We want to support them for sure. I think uh, the, my last comment is just the modifiability of some of those determinants and making sure we're communicating clearly because I see a lot of people designing interventions, but they're not necessarily modifiable. They are predictive, but not modifiable in the way we might you. want to. Yeah. And, and for me, this is why we built this platform with, with the population science, social determinants of health kind of data systems, because all the rest of them at NIH are basic science. And we need to have that same kind of vastness of knowledge, scope, and breadth on the population science data sets as well, so that we have better interventions. We know what pathways make a difference. And that changes over time in the life course of a person and dependent on their disease and disorder. Only the big data is going to allow us to understand that better. Thank you. Okay, I have a question to feed off of what you were just asking, Suchi, and I think I think Dr. Duran, you just answered it, but just to make sure, I was it, you made mention of um, bringing in. Sorry, I'm Betty Beckemeyer from the University of Washington. Hi. You you made mention of bringing in federated data sets and doing analysis with projects, and maybe that's an example. It because that when you that statement was kind of confusing to me, and I was gonna I was gonna ask for some kind of example of what that would mean. But was that sort of an example of of that? 
zip code. Yeah, um, zip code using zip code data. Yeah. Yes, that's an example. So, okay. so when even in the many of the federated data sets, you know, like the big data sets, we can um, drill down to know what zip codes that data is collected from, or, you know, there are many data sets that do that. And once we know the zip code of a particular area, you, you then can understand not only de the demographics, but really what are the social determinants of health there? Like, do they have food banks? Do they have, um, is it food security? Do they have transportation? Because you can get that kind of information from, from the federated data sets. And then if you match that with your project data, then you can better understand things like um, people didn't comply to their um, their medication regimen and their follow-up to their cancer care because they didn't have a way to get there mm -hmm. because there's no public transportation or there's no, um, no cab will go into their neighborhood because we do have neighborhoods like that. Right. Well, okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions from council? Online, anybody? Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Duran. Well, I appreciate I you joining us. This is I exciting. I'm eager to explore it myself. As I, um, I'm sure they're going to pass out the slides so you can get all the links. And I hope that you do, because I think that we need to get as much um, research in the areas of population science and social determinants of health as we're doing in basic science. And I really, you guys are the, the path to making that happen. So I am honored to be here and thank you for um your interest. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Really appreciate that. So, all right. I am uh, really pleased to introduce our next guest speaker, Dr. Men Lay. Dr. Lay is director of the Division for Research Capacity Building at the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. He oversees the Institutional Development Award, also known as IDEA and other research capacity building programs, including the Support for Research Excellence Program, the Native American Research Centers for Health Pro Program, and the uh, Science Education Partnerships Award. Before his government service, Dr. Lay studied the regulation of DNA replication as a molecular geneticist. Prior to coming to the NIGMS in 2018, Dr. Lay held positions at the National Cancer Institute and the National Science Foundation. So now I will turn it over to Dr. Lay as he gives us an overview of NIH's IDEA Research Capacity Building Program. Welcome, Dr. Lay. Thank you, Dr. Zink and Dr. Talov for the opportunity to speak to the <laughs> nursing research community and your outstanding council. Uh, I'm excited for the opportunity. Um, NIGMS, um, has three core mission areas. In addition to its traditional mission of supporting um, basic research in biomedical sciences, it also uh, covers an uh, important area that is building research capacity across the country. As Dr. Zink just mentioned, we have several um, programs in this mission area, mission area and IDEA being the largest but still not as well known as our basic science mission. So I'm uh, delighted to have the opportunity to give you an overview. Not moving. Here we go. Good, <clears throat> thank you. So. IDEA stands for Institutional Development Award. So there's emphasis on building the capacity at the institution level. So the program was authorized in 1993 by the Congress 
um, to support 23 states and Puerto Rico uh, to strengthen their bi biomedical research. And the states and Puerto Rico are showing colors on the map. And because there are 24 of them cover a huge geographic territory, so they're divided into four regions for administrative uh, uh, reasons. The, award, the first IDEA award was founded by the National Center for Research Resources, <clears throat> FITLI, in the uh, year 2000. And uh, in 2012, when um, NCRR retired, the program moved to NIGMS. In this first decade of the program, <clears throat> uh, IDEA program grew very rapid from under a million dollar to more than 20 million. Since move to NIGMS has been growing in a steady pace, uh, sort of uh, in pace with the overall NIH growth. So we are in our third decade now. And last year, I mean, actually current year, 2023, the phys uh, um, Congress allocated to us uh, about $426 million um, is about 0.9% of the overall NIH budget. With this generous support, uh, we focus our area, our effort in three areas. One is to support infrastructure enhancement, second is research workforce development, and finally, uh, competitive research. And those activities have two important features. One is that they actually support activities in basic clinical behavior and uh, translational research under all areas of NIH mission. In other words, actually goes beyond NIH GMS traditional basic science mission. Secondly, is that we primarily use institutional center or uh, network grants, so large grants, to support our uh, activities. We currently have five major funding programs. The first is our flagship program called Centers of Biomedical Research Excellence. Um, I'm going to go back to give you more detail uh, um, about this program. The second one is on the clinical and translational research space is closely, more closely aligned with NINR's uh, activities. And actually we're currently enjoying the benefit of the collaboration. So I'm going back to that program in a little more detail as well. The third major program called IDEA Networks of Biomedical Research Excellence or IMBRI. So we have 24 awards and one in each state. So how this program work is that it support statewide network that links the research institution with all primarily undergrad institutions in the state to support faculty research and more importantly to provide students primarily undergraduate students the research experience the opportunity for them to be engaged in cutting-edge biomedical research Another very popular uh, program is called IDEA Co-Founding. In this uh, space, we actually help uh, other NIH Institute to fund more of their uh, R1s and R15s when those applications just fall beyond those institutes pay line so that they get more support to IDEA State. The fifth one is called IDEA Regional Entrepreneurship Development Program, basically focused on uh, building entrepreneurship so that IDEA State can be more competitive in competing NIH uh, uh, SBIR, SDTR uh, opportunities. This program here actually is supported by NIGMS SBIR, SDTR uh, budget not from the uh, uh, congressional allocation for IDEA program. So <clears throat> give you some more detail about COBRI. So this is a multi-component uh, center program to support uh, the its development and uh, sustainability 
of research infrastructure and a critical mass of independent investigators in a given research area. So the diagram uh, on the slide shows you how this program uh, works. So on top is really the leadership administration of uh, a PDPI as an advisory committee, including the institutional leadership and external uh, expert and mentors and the pilot programs that I'm going to touch on a little bit. At the bottom, there are technology cores, service cores, and the research projects. So each of the research projects represent one component in the uh, uh, grant. So if you consider the leaders of the research pro program, a research project, uh, gemstones, so rough diamonds, where, where do they come from? We, we get them from two sources. One is institutional faculty hiring, so that is critical. And secondly is homegrown. We have the pilot pro program basically found smaller projects among the institutions, faculties, investigators to build them into a stage ready for the program. While the grant is for five years, each uh, research project leader uh, is supported by two to three years through this program. And during these years, they produce and publish. And when they graduate, we consider them diamonds ready to compete for independent research and uh, get to the promise and land. So this is essentially how it works to give sort of recap the key features of the program. Uh, as I mentioned, it include multiple components and each of them uh, are evaluated and scored separately during review. And the, the grant is actually uh, supported by uh, three consecutive five-year awards. And the first two phases are $1.5 million per year in direct cost. So the total cost is about $2.5 million. And the phase three is sort of wrapping up. So it's have about half of the budget. Um, the project leaders are typically early stage investigators or new investigators. So they're going to be there for the long haul. And also they're supported for two to three years. And uh, each project leader is assigned a mentor. The mentor actually get paid by the grant. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the advisory committee really include the uh, institutional leader as well as external experts to cover the scientific uh, area. And finally, the pilot program is, is to broaden the base and develop the bench. The key lessons we learned through the process of administering this program for the past 20 years, there's, uh, there are many, but the three are important ones, right? One is the research area really needs to align with the institutional priority so that can get a secured institutional support. Secondly, uh, the research area need to strike a balance that is focused enough so that the institution can develop the research excellence in the area. At the same time, is broad enough so that the institution actually can build to keep on hiring. In, the, in the, using nursing as an example, it's probably broad enough to be uh, oncology nursing, for example, but it wouldn't be, probably wouldn't be uh, broad enough to say leukemia nursing, right? So because we're supporting this through a 15 year period, we expect the institution to continuously build in this area. So that need to strike that balance. And finally is effective mentoring and uh, timely evaluation of the performance and progression of the research project and the research project leaders are critical for the success of the program. So just to give you an example, what kind of impact uh, in, uh, in, a Cobre can uh, provide. Here is an example of University of New England. 
and this is a uh, school university primar primarily based on its uh, school of um, uh, uh, um, osteopathic medicine. So they have one Cobri, and the Cobri current uh, finished just finished the first two phases. In other words, for ten years, it's currently in the third phase. So for the ten years, uh, for the first two phases, they received about uh, twenty-two million dollars overall. And uh, with this fund, they supported and graduated, uh, actually supported two research course. This is the infrastructure, and graduated ten. 10 tenure track the faculty investigators as the RPLs. Five of those 10 have been promoted to full professors. And uh, among them, they received multiple external grants, including R1s, R21, R15s, and foundation grants. So they are truly independent now. And uh, they are the investigators are productive published about 100 uh, uh, papers over 10 years and uh, the institution was extremely pleased that pretty much built on the strengths of this cobra their institution was elevated to obtain the uh, r2 classification in 2022 so that is the impact of a cobra can deliver so moving on to the idea clinical translational research program. Obviously, this is in the clinical and translational research space. The program is to support a statewide, um, a regional uh, network that does three things. One is to build infrastructure in the clinical translational space. Secondly, is develop workforce in this space so that the institution and the investigator can build effective clinical translator translational research programs. And finally, because many of the idea states share uh, similar health uh, challenges, so there's a need for collaborative research. So the idea CTRs serves as uh, leaders or conduit to coordinate the sort of nationwide uh, research activity. So those are also large awards uh, for five years, each award, uh, $4 million in, uh, total cost per year, and they're renewable. So this is um, how the award uh, is structured. As you can see, there are multiple components led by the PI uh, steering committee, executive committee uh, in the uh, admin core. It has a health research core to lead the research, has a research design compliance, a data management core to help uh, develop the protocols. And I have a technology service course to provide what is needed to do the research. And importantly, have a community outreach course and professional development course. And their network represented by lead institution as well as partner institutions and the very, very importantly, we require each idea CTR to have uh, the PBR uh, practice, uh, uh, pri private, uh, not practice, practice-based uh, research network associated, affiliated community clinics so that they can have broader reach to the patient base. And, um, the idea CTRs serve as leaders for uh, collaborations with other CTRs as well as a national uh, a research uh, resource center, which I'm going to talk about briefly in a minute. So, give you an example of uh, using the West Virginia idea CTR as an example. You can see on the left are the partner institutions that link up the whole state. So lead by the, the uh, uh, West Virginia University and the really include all the uh, significant institutions in the state with clinical research programs. And on the right, more impressively, is that it links up 130 clinics, 
community clinics throughout the uh, uh, state. So together, the network delivers a very effective system to uh, provide the health research the states need. And uh, there's no more powerful example than what they have done during the pandemic. Here is an example of two, uh, last few years, NIH Reddick's uh, underserved population Red, uh, initiative, which uh, Dr. Zink and Dr. Brenner, you heard this morning, both served in the governance committee. So because it's public health crisis, we had, we had to deliver, uh, send the funds to effective research organizations within a very short period of time. Because of that, our idea CTRs are extremely effective. Just to brag a little bit, out of the 130 awards NIH issued, and our IDEA programs have secured just under 30 awards. That's a remarkable accomplishment. And they don't didn't only participate, they actually delivered. Here's just, uh, just an example. They published a large number of papers. And um, to further highlight the effectiveness, you heard Dr. Duran mention uh, the N3C, or National uh, COVID Cohort Collaborative, established by NCAT. The idea CTRs uh, is a critical partner of this um, program, together with the CTSAs. And this is essentially is an EHR-based um, depository, COVID depository for clinical research. So um, the IDEA CTRs, why I say it's a critical partner because they their contribution was unique in the sense they deliver the diversity, the data of diversity, especially in rurality to the data. So you can see the the platform at this point has 16 billion data entries and the 1.4 billion clinical observations, 14 um, million individual EHRs, and 5.5 million of COVID positive cases. It's, it's extremely powerful. And as I mentioned, um, the IDEA CTR is really deliver the diversity of the data. And uh, you know that the pandemic hit the underserved diversity population the hardest. Therefore, this data really give the database its extra effectiveness in its research. So um, further confirm the effectiveness. So NIH in its uh, recovery initiative just uh, uh, granted the IDEA uh, collaboration, a big award for the uh, long COVID studies. So we have a very effective network of IDEA CTRs across the nation. Uh, there are 12 of them. And uh, to further empower this collaboration, we just launched a National uh, Clinical Research Resource Center, we call IKIRC. And uh, the award is just, the applications just got approved by our council. So the award hasn't gone out yet. So I can't get into the specifics, but just highlight two areas of service. One is to provide clinical trial service to all the IDEA CTRs affiliated institutions. Secondly, is really to develop clinical research coordinators for those programs. And we envision uh, the majority, if not all of the co uh, clinical research coordinators will be coming from research nurses. That's why from the get-go, we benefited the councils from the Dr. Zink, Dr. Byron, and others from INR. And going forward, we, we hope to benefit more. And uh, finally, I want to say that uh, while we have these five very effective funding programs, they do want, uh, wonderful things on their own. At the same time, they provide very powerful platforms for collaborations. 
I already mentioned one example that is the collaboration with NCAT for the N3C. Here's another example for a broader collaboration. So here we teamed up with Office of Research um, for Women's Health, and together we uh, called on 16, actually we called on all the NIH Institute and the offices, but 16 of them responded, uh, including, thank you, NINR, join us to supplement IDEA awards to further strengthen uh, women's health in IDEA states. So you can see that at the right-hand corner, this is innovative in the sense that all the institute come together to supplement the IDEA award, but sending uh, a fund on women's health research. So you can see the participation from our programs has been very robotic, uh, uh, robust, robust. Each year there are you know, 30 or 30 plus applications. The, the participation from NIH Institute are pretty robust as well. We got a definite over 50% success rate. So uh, this gives sort of our program the extra uh, strength to support IDEA state. So just to capture this in summary, so we have the five core programs as a pillars for effective programs, which helps us to reach out to NIH for participation as well as collaboration and together and to support basic translational and clinical and behavior research in the 24 states. Thank you. Wow, that was so much information very quickly. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. So I've asked Dr. Uh, Provencio Vasquez, uh, who is online, to help lead us in discussion. Uh, thank Dr. you, Dr. Provencio. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Lee, uh, for your presentation and sharing a successful program to build research capacity where needs are greatest, and also providing an impressive example of the impact of COBRA. I uh, had a couple of questions. Um, one was, uh, just to clarify, the IDEA states were identified as those that didn't have capacity to build their research infrastructure. Uh, and uh, you, you also, uh, in terms of ethnicity uh, or uh, diversity in each state, can you talk a little bit more about the diversity versus the identifying of uh, IDEA states? Thank you very much. Um, it's a very important question. And as I alluded, uh, this is a congressionally uh, mandated authorized program. So the membership uh, from 20 plus years ago remained the same. We do not have the authority to change it. Any change needs congressional uh, vote approval. Got it. So uh, you are correct in the sense that um, initially the initial membership was established based on the fact that the states that uh, did not have enough, they, they, they have some, uh, not enough, right? And um, um, so time have changed, but uh, those states remain in strong need for this kind of help. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, NIH needs to work with Congress, get approval from NIH in terms of further considerations of the membership. That I hope answer your, the first part of your question. The second part of the question really about the diversity is those states, if you look at the map, uh, they are large, they're mostly rural states. That yes. brings in um, an important dimension to the diversity. And also many of them um, are Southern states. That also brings uh, another dimension that in terms of underrepresented minority. And the furthermore is that almost um, over, overwhelming majority of Native Americans, Native American tribes are located in the states that further enriches the diversity. So 
there's, uh, I would say, at the established uh, establishment of the IDEA program, although diversity may or may not be the driving factors, considerations, but it just end up being an important uh, 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 factor there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Lei. And I do have a comment, and then I'd like to hear any thoughts from my colleagues uh, around the room. Uh, I did have to change my comments a bit after Dr. Laudan's uh, uh, presentation this morning because I was truly impressed of all the uh, initiatives that NINR are putting in place to really increase um, inclusion and to enhance the diversity and uh, supporting the workforce of, of nursing science. So my first thought was, could we use this as a mechanism to really jumpstart the agenda and the strategic priorities for NINR? And how could, how could that happen to really um, get the, 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 the country to really look at how we can support uh, the new lenses of NINR? Just a thought. J just to clarify, are you directing the question to me or to Dr. Zink? Uh, well, to, to whoever wants, you, to you, Dr. Leo, Dr. Zink, yes. Yeah, uh, I don't want to uh, overstep my boundary, <laughs> but uh, from, from my perspective, I think we have been doing this for a long time, right. focused on building uh, infrastructure, building uh, capacity. I think we are definitely happy to share um, the lessons we learned, the experiences we have. And so, as, as I mentioned, our programs, if you, if you think about it, it's really a matrix. We have COBRIs uh, focused on, has a heavy focus, build, on, uh, build institutions, uh, areas of research excellence through the development of uh, independent researchers. They can by virtue of becoming uh, competitive independent researchers can continuously bring uh, extramural funds to their institution. Right. We've also used the idea CTRs to not only address the most prevalent health challenges in the state, but also uh, uh, help the states and institution to build um, health research programs. In this case, it may be slightly different from an investigator-initiated research, you know, grant because health research often um, is large scale, needs more of team collaboration. So you notice the example that I, I showed for Idea CTR on the map. Uh, one of their partners in West Virginia actually. Uh, is their uh, State Department of Public Health. And so that is, um, from our perspective, we try to build uh, sort of in a comprehensive way uh, using different metrics to cover different um, areas. And we definitely welcome for all institutes to, uh, to see what fits your needs to uh, borrow anything we have learned from this, this is the one um, aspect. The second aspect is really um, collaborations. So I, I showed two examples of collaborating with uh, different institute to support um, sort of priority areas really to the, our collaborators. For example, women's health, we can say is our it's important to us, but it, you know we can't say that's the top priority, right? Every area is important to us. Another example I didn't have to uh, um, didn't have time to mention really brings uh, this collaboration even closer to the partners, to the collaborating in institute. If the institute is willing and interested in in joining us, that is. We um, have the COBRI program here. Um, 
But even when we have a large num uh, large amount of money from the Congress, but we cover 24 states, that's still stretched very thin, right? So we have uh, um, collaboration, ongoing collaboration with the ODSS, that's the Data Science uh, Office of Data Science Strategy, another one is ORWH, is that um, if we have meritorious COBRI applications in either one of those areas, they are welcome to fund one through their allocation. So that is directly built in that partner uh, organization's top priority area. That is not to say we're not going to fund meritorious uh, applications, those areas. You know, if they're, they're meritorious uh, um, applications, data science area, we're going to still fund what we're going to, we're going to fund, but ODS is just fund actually. So uh, that is another uh, sort of uh, um, strategies we developed in the last few years. So hopefully, this, this is the uh, FY24 will be the year that, that this start to materialize. So. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Open it up to the uh, other advisory board members. Yeah, thanks again for a fabulous presentation. It's, it's really great to hear a lot of insights into the COBRI programs. So you mentioned the University of New England just in a, as an example. And when I heard you talk through the successes like the 10 uh, tenure track faculty that have been supported up the project and five of those that continue to full professor. It brought me back to another large part of our conversation this morning about um, diversifying that yes. NIH supported workforce. So can you talk a little bit about the initiatives to ensure that those that are supported up the COBRI and related programs that, that that's done in a way that we're making sure that there's better representation among scientists that are, that are absolutely absolutely so we are very interested in diversifying uh, this portfolio um, reaching out to schools as you mentioned I purposely picked that that exam as an example because that university is not the typical flagship state schools it's primarily built on this this one school uh, of uh, orthopedic uh, not orthopedic, orthopathic medicine. Um, in the past, we actually have dental schools. I was looking for nursing schools as well. We do have participation from nursing schools, but up to this point, there hasn't been as the leading institutions. So um, we, from our end, we recognize the challenge from this, this uh, participation from more diverse schools. So we have actually recently, because our program every three years, we renew our funding uh, opportunity announcement. So we make um, sort of evolving <clears throat> modifications to better fit the need or our strategic goals. So one of the change we, we made recently is to actually uh, in the past, there was cut and dry requirement to serve as a PI. Uh, you have to have active NIH R1 funding in the COBRI area of research. So it, it was important because remember our outcome, we expect them to become independent uh, uh, investigators. So the mentoring capacity is important. But we also recognize to broaden this, we need to be a little bit more flexible. So we recently just changed it to the investigator to serve as PI has active funding. That's a very big difference in that. So this is just sort of uh, one example from our end uh, uh, our effort to diversify the portfolio. Thank you. I appreciate 
um, hearing about institutional grants that build infrastructure, but I didn't necessarily hear what type of infrastructure is being built at the IDEA institutions. Is it biomedical? Is it data science? Any combination or any any themes? So the, the biomedical is overall is an overall umbrella, right? So data science is included because data science is increasingly important. So I'll uh, give you an example, as a, as a matter of fact, the Imbri program that I mentioned that links up a, a statewide network, we three years ago actually added a data science core to each and every one of them so that uh, they have the capacity to uh, bring modern day data science, including cloud computing capacity to faculty and student, including those in PUIs, primary undergraduate institutions. So it is very broad. Is every capacity related to biomedical research? That's why on my slides, if you see the infrastructure, you know we have um, technology cores, like data science core. You can sort of rub, you know, loosely fit in those cores. And we also have service cores. For example, for behave, behavior science research, they don't necessarily use a lot of technologies, but they're, they're service course. For example, outreach, community outreach course. So all those we support. Anything else? Well, I'm so grateful for you coming. Um, I can say um, for me and, and a number of others at the Institute, we've really learned a lot from NIGMS over the last several years around capacity building efforts that you put in place, um, diversity efforts, as well as training. And so um, I think we're off to a good start. That was, I think, one of the motivations to have you, right, to make this connection with council. And as we're moving forward, we'd love to continue the conversations, not only learning from you, but thinking about how we can better collaborate and then thinking about initiatives on, of our own to lead. So thank you for coming and sharing. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity. I just want to say, just want to say one more thing is that um, uh, we would very much love to see more participation and involvement uh, from the nursing research community. Uh, you, we had a conversation two years ago. I think nursing um, really is a critical part of uh, the research enterprise, and uh, we would be uh, delighted if we have an opportunity to, uh, uh, to uh, help. Thank you so much. We couldn't agree more. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> All right. Um, so thank you, Council, for sharing your thoughts during um, all of those discussions. And that concludes all of our presentations for today. But before we wrap up our open session, um, we'd like to open the floor for any additional questions, uh, comments, or announcements from any member of Council. Maybe we've covered it. All right. Well, great. So, um, so again, thank you everyone for your attention and your participation today. Um, open session is adjourned. It is now 1.53 Eastern. So for council members, um, let's see, Elizabeth, help me out. 15 minutes. Okay. So we're going to go at 210. So if you can join us for closed session at 210 Eastern um, for council members attending virtually as a reminder, a separate meeting invitation was sent to you with login instructions for the closed session. So thanks again. <laughs>